what's up everybody i hope uh wherever you're at this video finds you safe and sound and, and doing well um this is matt Arenas from white and blue review uh we have another creating commentary today this episode is going to be a baseball episode actually i've actually found a game that has a reasonable enough run time to sit through and uh enough uh for us to be able to commentate through um on today's game we have current uh creighton baseball coach ed service and former ace current major leaguer ty block um today's game that we're going to be doing is uh their 2012 nbc tournament opener against in indiana state and shamanaya who's um now pitcher for the oakland athletics so um First of all, I guess, guys, Ty, Ed, I appreciate you guys hopping on. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing good, Ed. Good to see uh, you. Doing great. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, no problem. This is going to be a lot of fun. So I don't know if you guys have uh, ever watched a DVD commentary or not before, but um, since you guys are going to be the subjects of this and you're involved in it, it's going to be, um, I don't know, kind of fun to relive it a little bit, hopefully. What do you guys remember about, I don't know, just the, uh, I, I think this team, you know, because you guys have won the league the year before and went to the regionals and whatnot. And um, this was the year, if I'm not mistaken, where you guys were kind of expected to do, to have a really big season, but it didn't go that way during the regular season. Do you remember what, what your mindset was like going into this tournament in terms of maybe starting back at zero after maybe the regular season didn't go as planned? Well, I don't know if you remember, Ty. It's been a it's been eight years, but, you know, about <clears throat> once we got to about la latter part of April, we would meet as a team and we'd talk about, hey, we're, we're, we're not going to win the regular season, so we're going to get ourselves healthy, we're going to get ourselves lined up, we're going to get ourselves geared up to go into the conference tournament, knowing that we'd have to win the conference tournament to extend the season. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember when we went to Springfield that Monday, and we arrived on Monday night. We were going to work out Tuesday at 8 o'clock in the morning and then play on Wednesday. And um, we got there about the same time Indiana State got there. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to um, – I know I was kind of looking for something to eat. I normally don't eat with opposing coaches uh, before games or after games. But I know Coach Heller very well. So he said, hey, why don't we just go grab something in the um, – in the hotel we did and through our conversations i could tell that he he knew that the conference was very balanced that year that we probably were not an eighth seed and it was not going to be a typical one versus eight seed because he knew we had you sitting there waiting to pitch that first game and um, you know he had Manaya, so we knew that it was going to be probably a very low scoring game mm -hmm. and the team that made the fewest mistakes was probably going to come out on top do you remember the walk over to practice that next day, Ty? Do you remember that at all? Yeah, I, I just remember, like, like you were talking about, the lead up to the, to the conference tournament for, like you said, basically April. We kind of knew that we had no chance to, to get into the NCAA tournament unless we won the conference tournament. And it wasn't like guys, like, shut off for a few months, but it was like they really just kind of – honed in on that that conference tournament and when we were I remember walking to practice and there was just a different energy like guys knew like this is our chance and it was all or nothing and it was a lot of fun uh, there's just a ton of energy going on guys were excited and we had some life again uh, that we hadn't had for for like a month month and a half well you know we had to practice at eight in the morning so that meant we met in the lobby about 7.30, 7.20, you know. You mean and 6.30? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, good thing about, the good thing about that stadium is the, um, the field and the hotel are within about a block of each other. So we know we didn't have to get on a bus. So some guys even had their cleats on. Other guys had their turfs on. And we walked over. And I was, I was in the back. All the players were in front. And it was interesting. It was almost like the walk was in unison as we were walking to the park. And I could tell right then and there that we were about to have a different kind of a practice. And out of all the practices we've ever had during my time at Creighton, 
I would rank that one as as one of the better ones. Really? And we talked after we talked after practice, and we said, if we play as well as you practice today, it's going to take a really great team to get you. And uh, you guys continued that throughout the next four days. Yeah, we did. It was fun. I just remember, I remember, you know, watching Manai there in the first inning, what, what he did to us earlier in the regular season. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we all had a little bit of a chip on our shoulder because that was the day Eric Mattingly threw a no hitter. Uh, it was a Saturday at TD Ameritrade. Eric Mattingly comes out and throws a no hitter and we didn't score a run. And Manaya threw, I think, 12 innings against us that day. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, but guys had a little chip on their shoulder going into that game. Like, we're going to get this guy back. And uh, they knew that that 12 innings was going to wear on him at some point down the, down the road, and, and they were ready for it. From, from a pitcher's standpoint, like, I've always wondered if uh... – because you guys don't actually get to affect each other at all, you know what I mean? So the matchup thing, I wonder if that gets, like, overhyped at all when when they say it's ace versus ace or whatever. But, like, what, what goes into your mind as an ace when you're facing a guy that you know is that good? Like, what – how do you do, – is your focus different? Is your energy level different? Um, is your mindset different at all, knowing that you're facing a guy that, that that's, that's that good on the other side of the bump? Yeah, I think for me, uh, in a lot of those situations, it was just a great opportunity. And being able to have a situation where uh, you're facing a guy who you know is going to come out with everything that he's got, uh, it just it amplifies your focus even more. Um, you're trying to cut down on, on any mistakes that you can and, and limit any kind of damage as much as possible and give, give your team a chance. And uh, I just remember we were – uh, we had started playing pretty well the last like three weeks of the regular season. We, we had some really good matchups against um, Dallas Baptist, Wichita State coming in um, and things started to roll for the guys. And I could tell that that we were starting to become a different club. And for me, it was just just a matter of capitalizing on that opportunity and going out there and giving everything I had to, to give these guys a chance to to do what we wanted to do and, and win that conference tournament. Do you remember your strategy with this Indiana State lineup at all? Yeah, I, I just remember the big thing was that they had a really good lineup. They were they were one of the top offensive clubs in the country that year. And the biggest thing is was getting ahead, uh, trying to attack early and and put them on the defensive as hitters. Um, and if, if you could dictate counts, uh, which I didn't do the first time against them in the regular season, I walked a few guys that gave them too many free opportunities. Okay. And it put me in a bad spot, and I ended up blowing a lead, and we didn't, uh, we couldn't come back from it. So um, I just remember thinking during this game, like I'm going to come out and I'm going to attack, and I'm going to going to make these guys beat me if if that's what they're going to do. Well, Indiana State had a really good lineup tie. They had a nice balance of speed, like the leadoff hitter here, this Curry kid could really really run. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of the order, they had some power. They had at least two or three guys with yeah. 9, 10, 11 home runs in a collegiate season, which is a lot. So they had a very tough lineup to navigate through. Speed and power, not a lot of strikeouts in that lineup. So, mm -hmm. you know, you knew your defense was going to have to play a big part of this too. Absolutely. So um, for you to go through and, you know, and throw one hitter against that kind of a lineup, you know, it says a lot. Where's this field that you guys are playing at? Is this Springfield? Yeah, Springfield, Missouri State. Okay. It's Springfield, and uh, we, we, we had a lot of success there, yeah. We had a lot of success there. That's where Missouri State plays. That's where the AA Cardinals play their home games. Mm, gotcha. Nice pitch there. Slider. So I think you went. I think you went up in the zone to get him to foul that off, and then down and down and away the next one. Yeah, Coach Smith uh, had a pretty good game plan against these guys. After seeing them as many times as we had, um, you know, we we had a lot of at bats. I remember he had a, had a good scattering report for us coming in here. Uh, it was nice getting to face some lefties um, early on, just to kind of know that uh, 
you can, you know, lefties don't really like that, that fastball inside. So we tried to work that in and get them pretty well. And then opened up that breaking ball down in a way. Gotcha. Look like Coach Ty, um, did you guys have a conversation before this game started about how important it was to get deep into this game and give yourself an opportunity for the bullpen to be used later in the tournament? Well, obviously, we knew we had to win the tournament. So we were going to do everything we could to not only win this game, but to save our pitchers, to save our bullpen. Ty knew that. Ty also knew that runs were going to be hard to come by. So in, in the back of his mind, I'm guessing – He's thinking, I, I might have to throw a shutout today to win this game. And um, so I can't – I got to eliminate the free opportunities. I got to keep my pitch count down. I think Ty threw 109 pitches in that game. Um, and uh, to give my team a chance because he knew that we weren't, uh, we weren't going to score a lot of runs off with Naya. And, Ty, so before I let you answer that, that, I just want to direct you back to this play we just watched. Alex Daly throws a ball, and Judkins – who was one of the better defensive first basemen, saves a ball that easily could have gotten away from him. What does it mean for your defense to pick you up each time when you saw those kinds of things? Yeah, I mean, we had such confidence in our defense with, with the way coach service, you know, runs practice and, and the way our guys trained. We knew that anything on the ground was going to be a great opportunity to get, it, to get an out. So I was just trying to let those guys make as many plays as possible. You know, it, if they make a mistake, which was very, very rare, you knew they were going to get the next one. And and uh, Alex Daly had always done a great job throughout his career between second base and shortstop uh, of eliminating those errors. And then Nick Judkins obviously was incredible over there at first base, uh, just the way he was able to save so many runs, um, just just by picking the baseball. Uh, it, it, he was pretty incredible to have over there. Well, Nick was a Gold Glove winner. Yeah. Nick has a ball in school glove for a reason, you know. So he was he was determined by the rest of Division One baseball coaches to be the best de defensive first baseman in the country that year. So that was a really good stretch that he made on the play. So back to what I was asking earlier, Ty. Uh, what did your mindset? Uh, what was your mindset going into this game? It was it different at all because you know you got to go as deep as possible. Yeah, I think my last two outings going into the conference tournament really kind of helped uh, kind of lock me in. Uh, I had pitched really, really well against uh, Dallas Baptist and Wichita State coming into coming into this game. And uh, I just remember feeling a little bit more relaxed because earlier on in the year, I think I had put too much pressure on myself to try to do too much. Um, and it ended up ended up costing me. I didn't I didn't pitch as well. I didn't execute as many pitches. So I felt a lot more relaxed coming into this game, uh, but also really focused, uh, knowing that I was executing at a high level, uh, knowing that our defense was playing great. And, um, you know, as this game kind of wore on, I was just trying to give the team the best opportunity I could to, to win, uh, just continue to move on. And I remember getting into the, about the sixth inning. We, we had a lead and I said, you know, I, I kind of said to myself in the dugout, all right, I'm going to, save the bullpen because we're going to need them later on in this tournament and uh, just, just try to go the rest of the way. Ed, do you remember anything about the uh, offensive game plan against Manaya? At least I know you can't always, <laughs> you're kind of at the mercy of him making mistakes sometimes, but in terms of what you were looking for to take advantage of? Well, he, he pitched up in the zone a lot and a lot of left-handers do when they miss, they miss up. Mm -hmm. And the problem cool. is with the hitter is that you can see that pitch there, he missed up, up and in. How you throw the guy's head, you like that inside yeah. fastball up and in there? You know, <laughs> try to, um, try to get in on. If, we could, if we could leave the pitch up alone, I thought we had a better chance for contact, obviously contact results and hits. I thought we'd have a shot. But if we were going to – if we were to ball up, he was going to have the advantage all day. And if you notice the first couple innings, we had trouble staying off the pitch up. Mm -hmm. And then as the game wore on, and Boomer got a good pitch there to hit, just missed it. Um, as the game wore on, we got the ball down a little bit more. Our contact was more solid. And then we put some hits together, scored some runs. But the key was to him to push the ball down. Uh, his fastball was a, was a plus fastball, but he had a tendency to leave it up. So. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done, though, when you're yeah, seeing 90, sure. 91, 92. A hitter, hitters oftentimes feel like they have to cheat to get to the fastball. 
and then they have thus they have less time to recognize the pitch up or down. So we needed to force the ball down. I see, there's a few uh, a few guns in the seats. Was he thought of as a big time prospect at this point yet, or? You know, he was having trouble staying healthy, but when he was healthy, because he had so much movement on his pitches, he had that body that you could project that he was going to grow into a little bit. His fastball was probably going to even going to get better. Wait till you see his pickoff move later on in the game. Just gonna I mean, it's a first that. class, world class <laughs> pickoff move. So he had a lot of things in his favor. Uh, do you mean that world class balk that he has every time that I watched? You know, hey, if they don't call him, it's not a balk, right? Oh, yeah, so, exactly. In this particular game, they didn't call it. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we knew he was good. We didn't. I didn't project him to. You know, I don't know if he was a sandwich pick, kind of a supplementary pick in the first round or not. But that's that's a. Um, that's a that's a good draft choice. He definitely looks like he's having trouble commanding his pitches right now. Like he doesn't have feel for him because he's kind of yeah. Low. He hits he hits batters in this game, and then when he gets in trouble in the middle part of the game, it's with uh, it's with walks. The funny thing is, you know, Mike Gerber, which is this is Mike coming up to the plate. Yeah. You know, left on left, Mike had some good bats against him. Really. Um, not only in this game, but back in Omaha when we played him early in the season. Now, Mike doesn't feel too comfortable. I can't remember the last time you made Mike lay down a bunt right here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever yeah. seen him yeah. square around before. Especially with one out. Mike's bunting for a base hit here now. He's not bunting sacrifice. There's okay. one out. Mike's thinking, Mike's thinking, I got the third baseman back a little bit. Yeah. If I can roll it down there, I got a chance. Gotcha. You know, because Mike was a good runner. See where he's missing again? He's missing. Yeah, high. he's missing. So, he's missing high and really low. Yeah. Like he doesn't have got a much chance. command of what he's doing. He's got so much movement at this point in his career and his delivery that it was hard for him to consistently find that release point. Mm -hmm. uh, just there's a lot, a lot of moving parts, um, but that's also what made him successful. He's very deceptive, but his pickoff move. Now yeah. notice, notice his stretch tie. Remember we talked about that? How he yes. lifts his leg up and sets it down to come yep. to the set position, and then he goes into his um, delivery. Notice, look at that right there. That's like, the, uh, that's like the Sean Doolittle thing, isn't it? Yeah. Who he hit another but guy. He hit another. Yeah. So he was missing up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was a key to that game. Mike Gerber so still wears pitch the best of them. I played <laughs> with him last year. I saw him. Exactly. 15 times probably. Doesn't get out of the way. <laughs> that's all thanks to Coach Service and still. Good for that. you, Mike. Glad to hear that. Yeah, Ed has, had, Ed has had a few guys that like to just sit there and take one, huh? That he has. Yeah. Robbie Knight was was the king of it. Right. There's two. There's two things you can guarantee with Ed Service: is defense and HPPs. <laughs> that's the truth. Coach, I, bet, I bet Ed loved the I bet Ed loved the new rule where the umpires can bring guys back. Huh? That's your favorite new rule in baseball, isn't it? Yeah, you know, um, they they're getting a little better at that. But the first yeah. year they implemented that, we must have reviewed about a half a dozen of those because now you can <laughs> review these at the college level. tie. you haven't seen a college game probably in a while, but and uh, we got a couple of them overturned actually. So. Um, yeah, it's not one of my favorite calls. I think if you throw it in there and you miss. Uh, you know, the hitter should be able to advance. So I think Parker Upton's had like 60% of his HPPs called back since that rule was implemented. Yeah, Parker, to his credit, he doesn't move either. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Coach, what, uh, what instruction do you, did you give your base runners understanding Manaya's unique um, wind up once, he, once, the, once he's in there, not wind up, one, his unique uh, delivery once he's in a stretch? You know, we talked about it going into the game. We knew the guy had a plus pickoff move. Now, in this case, we have runners at first and second. So he's, he's not going to pick the first. But when we had runners on first and we don't have a steal sign or a bunt sign on, we want our base runners to take a reverse secondary, which means they take a step back toward first before they come out with their traditional secondary to prevent the pickoff. You're going to see in the middle part of this game, it didn't work because he got us a couple times. Um, and, um, so we, we didn't do, we didn't do a very good job of that reverse secondary to, to avoid or eliminate the pickoff 
because we knew he had a – I mean, this is the best pickoff move we've seen from a left-hander probably in our – in my time at right. Creighton. So we went into the series knowing that we had to be a little – we had to give a little bit at first base. We couldn't take our traditional lead. We couldn't be quite as aggressive. We probably weren't going to steal bags. We we're going to have to move runners other ways. Because he was really I, I good. remember at one point – it might have been. It might have been the year before his freshman year. You just had the guy stand on the bag because I think you took four yeah. guys off. <laughs> just, <laughs> Seriously, just a softball lead. Wow. Certain guys. Certain guys. That's, yeah, that's funny. All right, Coach or Ty. I don't rem- know if you guys remember this at bat, but looking at the stats, Jake delivers an eight pitch at bat here, and he does so really to put some pressure on Manaya. Do you remember it at all? Now, it doesn't end up resulting in a base hit, but this at bat, he fouls off three, four pitches and ends up going eight pitches deep. Well, you know, Jake really came came on the second half of the season. You know, he's a freshman here. We all know Jake Peters playing professionally now with the Dodgers in AAA. But um, uh, Jake was a freshman, and he had his ups and downs. We knew he was going to be a tremendous player. Just a matter of him just getting more comfortable, get more uh, uh, added strength. But uh, he didn't shy away. I mean, he—you could tell just by his approach to this at bat that he was locked in. And uh, even though he didn't get a base hit, he he allowed us to get to him in the middle part of the game. These these eight, nine, ten pitch at bats, even though sometimes they don't they don't result in a hit. Ty knows as a pitcher they drive him nuts. He'd rather see the guy get up there one or two pitches and either get on first base or make an out. Pitchers get frustrated when they go deep in the count like that. Mm-hmm. I remember sitting on the bench watching this at bat and just being like, just keep going, Jake, because he had already hit a couple guys, giving us a fr- some free bases. So this inning starting to get long on him. And I knew the sooner that we could get to their bullpen, the better chance that we had um, just because he was that good. So if if we could continue to extend out some of these at bats, you know, I think right here we're all in the dugout, just pulling for Jake. Just keep going, man, keep going, and and uh, we knew it was going to pay dividends later. I, from a left-hander's perspective, what you know, Ed talked about laying off that high fastball. What 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 is the advantage when you're left-handed of bringing that thing in in there? And why can't hitters, even though they have the mindset to lay off of it, why is it so difficult? A lot of it is, is the <laughs> amount of run that, that he creates that a lot of left-handers create. So um, they're creating a lot of arm side runs. So while that pitch may look like it's going to be a strike right there on the inside corner, it's actually running in off onto his hands. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the ball's starting behind him from, the, from his arm angle. So right here, this pitch is coming from almost behind Jake. And then it's coming, looking like it's going to be over the middle and then running in on his hands. So it makes it really hard for lefties because they have to stay in there so long and respect, you know, away right there. Yeah. Because what ends up happening is you think he's coming in, you start cheating, you start cheating, and it opens up any kind of pitch away, whether it's a fastball right there or a breaking ball down in the zone. Um, so that's that's the big thing with lefties that you see. Gotcha. One thing to think about in this game, the two starters both ended up pitching in playoff games for their respective teams and, and for their both teams in the Bay. But, Ty, you, you got into a game against the Cubs that I don't want to talk about. The Cub and, killer. And, um, <laughs> Minaya was able to pitch a wild card game for the A's, but it's just – you look about look at the talent on the field in this game. The two starting pitchers both end up at the MLB level – Ty is an opening day starter for the Giants. Manaya ends up being a wild card pitcher for the A's. And you go up and down the, the Creighton lineup. Ben Boom, Gerber, and Ty were all in the majors last year. Jake Peter was just a step away at the AAA level. And, Coach, if you'd help me out, how many of the guys on the Indiana State roster ended up making it to high levels of professional baseball? Well, they had another really good pitcher, too, Ty. I don't know if you remember that. Dakota. Yeah. Dakota Bacchus. I faced him last year. He was a guy, too, a junior college pitcher. and He was normally their front-end guy. Yes. But Keller flipped him against us because he saw our left-handed bats we had up and down the lineup, so he threw Manaya yep. instead of Dakota at us. But I think Dakota played quite a while of, of professional baseball, too. I'm not sure what level he got to. 
they had the player of the year oh, wow. on their team, a kid by the name of Robbie Ort, who was yep. probably a fourth or fifth round draft choice as well. And I don't know exactly. I think he got the. I think guy. he gets the only hit in this game. Did he? Is he the one that got the ground ball up the middle that Staley got a glove on? Mm -hmm. It comes right here in this inning, this as a matter of fact. Right here. This is him right here. Yeah, big physical left-handed bat. And I know he was an early draft choice. I'm not sure how high he got. And Ty looks pretty skinny before the, in those pre-championship uh, center weight room days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you forget about Chance Ross, too. You know, Chance yeah. Ross moved up to AAA as well. So he was, he was playing third base for us. So you had Chance at third, AAA, Jake at second, AAA, and then Ty in the big leagues, Anthony in the big leagues, Mike Gerber in the big leagues. Um, am I missing anybody else that was on that club, Ty? Uh, Kurt Spomer played for a long time. He was in double A. I forgot about Kurt. Be ticked yeah. to mention Kurt. Yeah, he, he was. A, he got up to triple A with the Tigers. Yeah. This is one of the rare cases that you went to a full count, Ty, as, uh, as you missed there just a little bit inside. Yeah, I think I think – knowing that these these guys were dangerous we're, we're really trying to execute pitches but not trying to give them anything too good to hit so we moved his feet right there and we were able oh, to oh that's the oh that's the only thing they got that's it yeah <laughs> wow that was it that was a ground ball in the, up the middle and yeah staley got there alex nice nice play to get there and he all his momentum was taken away from the from the yeah. from the bag otherwise maybe he gets more on that throw that's really good yeah, range by Alex, though. It's one of those that nowadays in pro ball, that's a routine out with all the shifts that they do with left-handed mm -hmm. hitters. Right. It's kind of kind of funny to see that. And Ed, you see right there them them doing what you had said. Runs are going to be a premium, so they laid down the sacrifice bunt right away, trying to get a runner in scoring position. That reminds me of very much the way I joined the team the following year with you. And a lot of times in 13, 14, and 15, we would play for one run early, especially. I remember you'd all often talk about getting that first run and how much pressure it puts on the other team. Yeah, and Coach Heller doesn't normally bunt that early in a game. But you could tell by that bunt that he thought it was going to be a one- or two-run game. And – I don't know. It, it's too bad we can't go back, but that's a heck of a play by Chance Ross. I was going to say, who's yeah. playing third for you? That throw was. Yeah, granted. Yeah. See how yeah, Chance was... came out around the ball tie? He got into foul territory. His body's in foul territory, even though the ball's in fair ter territory. Yeah. And then he throws an absolute seed to first yeah. base. Chance Ross could really throw. You know, um, we, we, we just assume that play's a routine play. That was a good bunt. And right. Chance made it like it was nothing. He was really – one of the best third basemen we've had on coming in on plays. And the bunt play is a play a third baseman must master. And Chance, who's a former shortstop, really, really mastered that play the last year and a half that we had him at third. I'm glad you brought that up because that was – when I just watching that, I was like, that's a major league level yeah. execution of that play there. Because normally guys are like a little bit unsure. They get caught in between. They're like, is it going to roll foul? Should I let it go a little bit, you know? And then they kind of barehand it and just like heave it. There he, was like, no hesitation. He, he, attacked, he attacked that thing the whole time. He thought he was going to pick it up and throw. I was glad you play. noticed that too because I'm going, wow, that was a really good play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll never forget the practice that you made Chance run about 20 of those in a row where yeah. it finally clicked for him. And I just remember sitting there and like, like that was when we knew that he was going to be really good over there. I think it was in the fall that year and just, just seeing him – go about and, and do that it might have been the year before but it was just like wow like this is incredible like how athletic this kid is he, he was one of the best athletes that we had on that team and and just to see the work that he put in and see it pay off and then come through in a big moment like that that's that's a testament to your coaching there too yeah he uh he was a fun guy to watch Ty, was, he one, of, Ty, was he one of the better defensive third basemen you've played with in your career Ty yeah, I mean, we had some really good ones when I was there. So Chance was there, and then we had Jimmy Swift playing third base my, my freshman year. Uh, he, it's pretty hard to beat Jimmy over there w with what he did. Uh, he was in pro ball for several years. So there's some really good ones that we've had um, throughout time. So Now, this must be one of the few times you were in trouble that game, Ty, right? So they actually yeah. got guys on first and second. We got one out. 
Um, and they got, let me see who's coming up for them. Is it the bottom uh, eight, nine, or is it, are they about to turn the lineup over? Uh, this is the bottom. So I think right there we got behind, you know, we threw a two, one breaking ball and missed and, and we didn't want to try to give in um, knowing that we had kind of the, the, the bottom couple of guys coming up and uh, just looking for that, that patented coach service double play ball right here. <laughs> So yeah, they've got the seven, eight hitters, and that, that's one of Ty's only two walks in the game and his only hit. So, yeah, this is the only time in the game he's in trouble. Did it matter to you, stretch or wind up at all, Ty? No, not really. I feel like um, when you get into a good rhythm as a pitcher, uh, it's really fun to pitch out of the windup just when you, when you get going. But you have to make your best pitches the game out of the stretch. You know, so being able to locate that pitch right there, 0-1, just put a really good pitch on the outside corner, set yourself up um, here in, in a really advantage pitcher count. Uh, you know, you, you're going to always have your your most important pitches of the game with guys on base. So uh, you have to be able to be comfortable with both. Ooh, you almost stole, like, you almost, like, you almost, yeah, you almost stole a strike there when you didn't want to. It was a strike because it, it even fooled <laughs> yeah. me. And, and, and Anthony was a receiver. And he caught it funny. And because he caught it funny, that's a really good home plate umpire, Dave Conlon. He's done a lot of series games. He, he caught him off guard, too. Now, that was a real good pitch that guy fouled off. That was a tough pitch. Uh, Coach, how much what? freedom did you give the pitchers in, in, at this point to call their own games, or were they all coming from the dugout? Well, Coach Smith was our pitching coach at the time, and he was very, very well prepared. But the pitcher always had an opportunity. So if Ty wanted to call something off, we would never question that. We wouldn't question that at all. So Ty had the freedom to call what he felt he could get that hitter out with. So, um, but I don't think Ty shook him off very often. I think Ty stayed the course. He <laughs> trusted uh, the plan that we had set for the game. You guys did so much homework and, and the scouting reports that you guys put together – all the research, the the spray charts and everything. I know all the time and effort that went into that. And as a pitcher, when you see that data, it makes it a lot more easy oh. for you to. Now that's a big play there. It yeah. Took, yep. You know, it took him out. Nice throw. Yeah, that was they go, go and get it and just hurl it. Problem is, I don't think Chance ever tagged him much. Oh, yeah, he's definitely safe. <laughs> you know, that would be replayed now. That would be replayed now, yeah. and uh, we'd still be in a predicament because they would have overturned that. Yeah, for sure. He didn't think he was safe, though. No, he didn't argue too much. The ball yeah. beat him. Yeah. But uh, Chance has got to do a little better job of getting that glove down a little sooner. Mm -hmm. That throw by Anthony was really good, though. He had to just go and get it and barehand it. Yeah, he had no problem throwing. Anthony. <laughs> yeah. He could throw with the best of them, yeah. Really? Yeah, it was really cool to see him kind of like break through last year finally because, you know, you th those those moments seem like they're just so rare where a guy spends a lot of time in the minor leagues and um, plays at different levels and they settle in and they never really feel like they're going to break through finally. But for him to finally find a, you know, an organization that just decided to uh, keep elevating him and then for him to get his moment there where he got the – Did you play against him at all <laughs> Yeah, actually, we uh, we played against him in Salt Lake City this year. So um, Pat and I got to, or uh, I think Mike and I. It was Pat was that was when Pat's wife was sick. But uh, um, Mike and I got to go to breakfast with Anthony one day and catch up. So that was really fun. Um, and just to just to see him have the opportunity that he did. This was right after he had been in the big leagues, um, and then he was back over with the Angels then. So uh, he'd, he'd already been in the big league. So to see him after that and to, to be able to congratulate him on that moment and all the hard work that he'd put in and then to go back to the team that it all started with for him, I thought that was, that was pretty fitting. Uh, and I think he's got a really good chance this year um, having, a, having a quality year with them. He didn't even step into that throw either. He was already stretched when he picked it up. Like he stretches to pick it up. So all he has to, that was all arm basically, that, that whole throw. He doesn't. He, didn't, he had no base at all. He's, He's always been really athletic. Boomer was a really athletic player for us, and when he didn't catch, he played left field. Oh, really? He he did a little bit of everything, and and uh, you know it's funny. I was watching a game last summer, just flipped on a Saturday afternoon game, 
and the Angels are playing the Bull Sox, and it, Boomer's catching, Anthony's catching, and Mookie Betts tries to steal on him, and Anthony threw him out. Yeah, that's I, right. I remember that one. I, I wasn't surprised because we always knew he had a plus arm when he was when he played here for us. Yeah, I remember him gunning down Mookie. That was crazy. Back to the top of the lineup here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, second time through, we started to, we started to have a few better at bats. Um, we started to stay off the fastball that was up a little bit more, like that pitch there. Brad would like to have that one back. Is this Brad McEwen right here? Yes, yeah. yes, it is. Wow, he filled out by the time he was done. Omaha guy, Millard South. Like, he looks like a little guy right here. Yeah, Brad was really athletic. This was his freshman year, I think. Really. It was. Even though he didn't that was, that was out of contact, he got, a, he got a better pitch there. You know, you could just tell the guys are starting to settle in a little bit. There's a lot of nerves that first game because mm. the, the importance of it. It's no one wants to come through the loser's bracket in a conference tournament. So there's a lot of pressure. You want to win that first game. It usually takes a couple of innings for everybody to settle in, and then you start to see uh, this, the better players take over. And how did you manage this this group? You know, like, I think, I don't know if we've mentioned it yet, but, I mean, because they had such high expectations and the regular season didn't go the way they probably wanted to, and like Ty alluded to earlier, you know, just kind of locking in for this moment, this weekend right here where it felt like their last chance. Like, how did you manage them through all the disappointment of not living up to the expectations coming off of such a good year the year before? Well, this group was fighting the game a lot. You know, we were just fighting the game. We were – we, we forgot about fighting the opponent. We were fighting the game. And we didn't deal with adversity. And there's always going to be adversity in a baseball game. And the expectations kind of got, up, it got the best of all of us. And then, like I say, sometime in April, when it became clear that we weren't going to win the regular season, we turned our attention to preparing to win the conference tournament because we still felt like we had a talented roster. We just weren't playing as well as we're capable of. Mm -hmm. we lost a lot of games late. We weren't as strong defensively as we were late. And then we struggled a little bit offensively. I thought our pitching was pretty sound. We had trouble scoring runs, and then we seemed to have a mistake late in the game that ended up costing us a lot. So I knew we weren't that far away, even though our record didn't indicate it. And I knew the other teams in the league knew we had a talented roster. And it was just a matter of us putting it together. And like Ty said early, you could see some signs of it when we played Dallas Baptist, when we played Nebraska, we played Wichita State. We were starting to swing the bats a little bit better. Our pitching was always pretty good. And our defense was getting more comfortable. And we were very, very anxious to get down to Springfield. We couldn't wait for that conference tournament to get started. And the guys proved it by how they we, – we not only won all four games, but we really dominated the better part of all four of those games. So um, they really weren't that close with the exception of the championship game that we had to come from behind it. Mm -hmm. The rest of the games, we kind of were in control from the first pitch on. Ty, do you remember the lowest moment of the season at all? Like just a low point for the guys as a collective where they felt like it wasn't going to – all their expectations that they had for – when in the regular season, maybe earning that large bid where all that stuff kind of came to a, a final close in your guys' mind. Do you remember that at all? Yeah, we had a couple of them that year. Uh, I, I think spring break trip, we had we had a tough spring break trip. Um, we played okay the first weekend, and then we played pretty good against Cal um, on the road. Uh, this was after they were coming off a really big year the year before and had a really solid team. Mm. And uh, – so Cal, uh, we, we played them really tough, but then we got smoked the next day by Sacramento State, I think. And oh, really? just it was, it was a disappointing loss. And, and then we played at Pacific the, the next weekend, and we had a really tough weekend. And I just remember we had some, some team meetings on that trip that just some, like, really heartfelt emotional meetings just trying to get the guys to come back together and to right the ship to figure out, you know, where we were wrong, uh, you know, how to – kind of like Coach Service said, we were fighting the game so much, fighting each other, that we weren't really uh, 
weren't really fighting the other team. And so what ended up happening was we kind of fought through some of those, those battles there for a few weeks. And then um, I, I can't remember who we were playing in, in the conference tournament uh, or in the regular season in conference, but we had another really tough weekend. I don't remember if it, it was at home. It might have been Indiana State. Um, actually, actually at Evansville on a Friday night time. Is that, is that we, what? We, we kicked it away late. We made, yes. some, we made some mistakes that we normally don't make. And, you know, we, we just didn't deal with it well after the game either. It was a lot right. of guys very frustrated. And, That's and that right. probably, to me, was the low point. And then from that moment, things started to turn slowly. Yeah. We were just having trouble with inconsistency. Like, we'd go out and play Wichita State, and you dominate them on that Thursday night, and then we wouldn't play well the next two days. Right. We, we won a lot of – Friday night games, and then we had trouble, you know, backing it up with a good performance on Saturday. Mm. So we were just inconsistent in our in how we went about our business and our and our performance was just, and that's something that we just weren't accustomed to. So we had some adversity. Here's their leadoff hitter getting on. That is so adversity, and we had a hard okay. time. Yeah. I got him. I didn't think that got him. Did it? Uh, that was his 19th there's, by pitch. Uh, of that's, that's getting called back for there's sure. Your, there's your lean in, lean in over the plate rule, Coach Service, right there. Yeah, there it is. There it is. That pitch, that pitch is barely off the corner. <laughs> yeah, there's no way that's holding up under replay. Now, he's a really, really good runner. So, let's see how uh, – with two outs, you would think that he's possibly going to test you guys. Yeah, Ty, how do you – how does a pitcher – control a running game here, especially when you have a, a, a really dangerous threat on, on base. So like that pitch, I was really quick to the plate, trying to trying to vary my moves here. So I'm going to pick off, keep them there. You just, you just, you can't let them get into a rhythm as a base runner. So you're always varying your timing, you're varying your looks, you're varying your leg kicks, varying your pickoff moves, um, pitching out if you have to, guy like this. So I went with the high leg kick pickoff, and then I go slide step right there on a breaking ball, knowing that he's going to probably try to try to advance on something down. So try to be try to be a little quicker and give Anthony the best shot that I can. Because if I can if I can get the ball to the plate in under 1.3 seconds, then Anthony's got a really good shot of throwing him out. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, you did that. I think that's that's pretty well executed right there because you did like you said three or four different things never really got him a, gave him a chance to read you at all before getting the grounder. Yeah. And it's one of those things where you have to be able to still execute pitches too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've run into it over my career too, where you get so concerned with a base runner, whether it's Billy Hamilton or, or somebody like that, they get on base and you try to do too much and pay too much attention to those guys. And then you make a bad pitch and you give up a three run Homer or, um, you know, you give up a ball in a gap. So instead of just, you know, that one guy who, who you know, he's going to burn and, and has a good chance of stealing a base against you no matter what you do, you make a bad pitch. And next thing you know, it's it turns into two or three or four runs instead of just maybe, you know, a guy on second or a guy on third with one out where you could potentially work out of that inning. With Billy Hamilton, I think you should have strike the guy out before he gets to home plate, basically. Yeah, well. I, he's going to steal whatever he wants out there, it seems like, most of the time, right? <laughs> Yeah, he's one guy that I, I just, for whatever reason, have made some bad pitches to, and, and he's got – he's had some success off of me. He's super dangerous when he gets on base. Yes. Ty, at what point did you feel like you started to find your rhythm? Because that out, the one you just recorded to end the inning, is one that starts 18 consecutive batters retired from you. So you go through, you don't allow another runner until the ninth inning. At some point you had to realize I've really got, got myself in a groove. When do you think that was, or do you recall at all? Yeah, I, I remember, um, actually, I, I was thinking about it that last half inning, you know, the second inning I had traffic, they're starting to threaten. And then Manaya comes out and has a really, really quick uh, top of the third inning. I think he threw like eight or 10 pitches and it was boom, I'm right back out there. And I thought to myself, okay, like I've got to come back out and, and shut this momentum down that they're starting to build. 
uh, and try to swing it back our way or, or kind of keep it status quo for right now. So I remember thinking that that uh, bottom of the third inning was a really big inning. So to get out of that, I think it kind of started to build some momentum for me um, and just kind of pulling for the guys to start getting some momentum going offensively as we've got the middle of the order coming up, uh, knowing that he's left some pitches over the plate. You know, Chance had a good one to hit right there. Um, so knowing that he wasn't quite as sharp, we could tell that, you know, he hit a few guys and uh, just – you know, just looking forward to that opportunity that he was going to hopefully give us. Statistically speaking, in that third inning, 19 pitches were thrown by both of you. Manaya threw eight, you threw 11. Yeah, that, that's when, that's when uh, pitchers' duels can get really fun because you get back into the dugout, you get your water, you settle in, you're still kind of in the rhythm from the inning before and the next guy's done and you just kind of things kind of roll. So sometimes those pitchers duels, they just, they happen real quick because both guys are in rhythm, you know, they catch a breather and then they're right back at it and there's no time at all wasted. And um, when you're facing, facing guy with his uh, caliber of stuff, it, it can, it can go back and forth in a hurry. Chance is a good, good at bat. Notice how he got that pitch down. Yes. Yeah. Here's where the fun begins now, because Manaya knows that Chance Ross is one of our better runners, so now he's going to pick the first base. But Chance had a real Chance was one of our hotter hitters going into that tournament. Really, yes. he continued today with in this particular game. He had a great game, and uh, great at bat there. Now we got a chance to move him up. Watch how the execution of this rundown by Indiana State on the pickoff here. So they don't pick him on that one, but Chance doesn't look comfortable. You can tell by his body language. He didn't get a good read on that pick there at all. Manaya knows it as well. Chance doesn't need a big lead right now because he knows Boomer's going to bunt. But Manaya picks him anyways. And um, he gets him right there. Notice how they failed this rundown because it becomes – that's not how you practice it, is it, Ty? Right. <laughs> and um, – <laughs> going to find out how that comes into play next inning that's a big big play in the game next inning their inability to execute a rundown yeah that and is. they almost execute this one wow i mean we don't i don't know if we've ever practiced it that way at creighton you know kind I of have a cut there i can't remember last time i saw anything like that Coach, now you, you talked about that one being mismanaged. As you're at third base, what sticks in your brain? Do you think about that the next time you have an opportunity, that they almost missed it here? I might need to take advantage of that and put more pressure on them next time. What I'm thinking more than anything else is they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable. They're, they, we, we got them into a situation, and they didn't execute it. So what we've got to do is we've got to force them into more execution, more situations. because. Um, they just looked uncomfortable. And there's a lot of pressure when you're the number one seed. And you could tell the longer the game went on, and, and we were in a tied game, it favored us. It didn't favor Indiana State. And they knew that. And what that rundown or that failed rundown proved to me is, get them in situations, they're going to give us an opportunity. They're going to break down. They're going to make a mistake. And you'll see that later on here next inning that they made a few mistakes for us. Ooh. Yeah, when you see a guy go in steady like that on a pickoff tie, is it automatic or throwing the next one first again? Yeah, a lot of the time, because it means that he didn't see something very well. And right. and you could tell that he even had threw a little better pickoff move at him the second time. Uh, just a little more hesitation in it, a little, little longer of a hold on it, pause at the top. Um, so he, he knew if he – if if he wasn't that comfortable that he was either going to be diving back to the bag and make it really hard for the bunt, you know, for him to advance on a, on a poor bunt. Uh, but at the same time, if, uh, if that guy's that uncomfortable, there's a good, good opportunity. You're going to get him on the next one. Have you ever fooled anybody really bad before? Uh, I don't technically, I don't really pick a ton of guys off uh, that way, but what, what I've had some success with is, is making guys dive back to the bag when I'm going home. Oh, really? uh, so then thinking I'm going to pick off and then I actually throw a pitch. So uh, uh, just like you said, varying that they, they think it's going to be a pickoff and then they'll, they'll kind of like 
dive back and you know that that one or two steps where they're they're heading back to the bag is all the difference when it comes to being able to steal a base or get a good jump on a on a ball in a gap or uh even go on a uh ground ball that that might be a tougher play to get the lead runner mm -hmm. the thing you can notice here the, the thing you notice here uh, guys is how the hitters are starting to take pitches yeah mm -hmm. comfortable they're taking pitches that are just all out of the zone they're not jumping to the ball that was a good take by scott thornburg they're they're settling in you could tell that we're, we're not that far away from putting an inning together just by how they take pitches it's not always the contact that you make as a hitter. It's how you take the pitch that tells you whether the hitters are gaining an advantage. Now, that was a really good at bat by Scott. The guy just made a good play on him and threw him out. But he took a lot of borderline pitches. And you're going to see as we get closer to turning the lineup over next inning, that's when we have our big inning. Yeah, there was three really good at bats there because, you know, obviously – uh, chance got on and you know Anthony was just a little early on that first one um but he was right on it and then uh like you said Scott had a good at bat there so that was three really in a row good at bats against him so you probably were feeling pretty confident as an offense yeah when, when the offense like that starts that's when, really pitcher, that's when Ty's got to go out to get the hitters back in the dugout as quick as possible right? oh yeah absolutely and, and when the offense we had struggled so much that year and you start to see guys have a little bit of confidence, you have to capitalize on that. And, and as a pitcher, you can feel that. Like Scott took two really good swings at a bat. I knew Boomer just missed one. You know, he, he came into the dugout frustrated that he just missed hitting the ball in the gap. And, uh, and Chance obviously hit a ball really, really hard. So you get three really good swings. You know that they're, they're seeing the ball, and those swings start to build momentum as a team offensively. So – you're wanting to do as much as you can as a pitcher to, to keep them in that rhythm and uh, let them get right back after it and hopefully continue that momentum. Yeah, this is a pretty deep league here when you look at the eighth place team at just six games under overall. Normally the bottom feeder is like 30 games or 20 games under. There's a lot of talent in the league that year. Mm. I mean, you look, you look at the, the best pitching, pitching guys in that league. You had Missouri State. You had Pierce Johnson, who was a first-rounder, uh, just signed a $5 million deal with the Padres. Yep. Um, you had uh, Evansville. Uh, that was Kyle Freeland's freshman year uh, down there. Obviously, one of the top guys for the Rockies. So, um, you know, there's a lot of really, really quality pitching, uh, which, is, which is fun to see. Um, and then a lot of really good hitters that, that I've faced throughout my career up and down that league too yeah those Fridays must have been fun this year yeah there was a lot of really close games on Friday nights um a lot of low scoring games uh games where free bases made all the difference in who won and who lost um wasn't a lot of fun if you were a hitter <laughs> no, no. <laughs> how fun are those Friday games you know, I guess for both of you, but, you know, Ed's not going to go to school all week. But, Ty, like, how fun is it to have a Friday game after, a, like, a week of school and practice and, like, then you get in there and, uh, you know, you're facing arguably a future major leaguer on the bump and everything like that. Like, I always feel like when you go to those Friday games, it feels like, I don't know, it always feels like the first day of summer every single Friday game because it's like the end of a long week and it's a, it's a good battle. <laughs> thing. Like, what do those Friday games feel like to you? Yeah, well, that was a great catch by Nick Judkins right there. I, I remember thinking, holy cow, first baseman ran a long way to get there. But those Friday games were a ton of fun, um, especially because you're usually leaving on like a Thursday afternoon if, you, if you're going on the road and, uh, you know, you, you roll into to a place Thursday night and, uh, that, and then that Friday afternoon, just, just the, the anticipation of, of getting ready to go um guys are just jazzed up it's just you know that that you can't sleep the night before everybody's amped up and and you've been waiting three days to play baseball again so uh those are always a blast um you get into some of these games where you got some really great pitching matchups uh on friday nights and know that you know it's anybody's game and just you're anxious to see how it's going to play out
Coach, you had mentioned earlier about Nick Judkins being a, a gold glove or a tie. You just mentioned it. But I want to highlight both those plays. First, the, the ball he goes to get down the line in foul territory. But suddenly, the next play, it's a ball coming right between Jake and, and Nick. And he takes a step towards the ball and is able to regroup and run back the bag. So Judkins, he was one that doesn't get enough attention for how good he was defensively, even though he got a gold glove. Hmm. Well, he was, you know, it, it really helped Nick that he, he used to be a shortstop second baseman. You know, he came here with the understanding he was going to play second for us. So I think that gave us a lot more range at first well, base. Well, he recruited a middle infielder and moved him around? No way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, doesn't happen very often, but <laughs> Coach, we should be relabeled shortstop. You, yeah. I mean, other schools that I've worked with, they don't recruit twelve shortstops. You do, and put them in the best location. Yeah, well, that really helped Nick, you know, and and I think he, you know, I give Nick a lot of credit because I think he would have preferred to put, play second base, and he did it for the betterment of the team, and and I think uh, as the more he played it, the more he actually enjoyed it. He started to realize, hey, I, I can do some things over here that are a little different than a typical first baseman. Now, Nick was only about 5'9 or 5'10. You normally like your first baseman to be maybe 6'2, six, 6'4, six, bigger target, right? But Nick, uh, he had really good instincts. And you mentioned it, Glenn. You know, when that ball went in the four hole, some first baseman would have went for the ball, not got it, which then makes a, a really tough play for your second baseman, right, Ty? Yeah. He's got to get you as a pitcher. Covering first base, that's a moving target. That's a tough play. So for Nick to see that and then re go back to the bag and let Jake make the play is a play that, again, as a casual fan, you realize, ah, oh, it's just a 4-3, right? No, that was a little different than a normal traditional 4-3. Yep. Coach, you see on the screen here one of the other teams, I believe it's Missouri State, sitting there watching the game. In a conference tournament, do you want to play that first game and get it out of the way, or do you want to be able to watch some of your other possible opponents? What's your preference? Well, this I think is the, This is the second I, game, isn't it, right? Didn't someone play before you yeah, guys? This is the second one, but I think the players would prefer to play right away because mm -hmm. otherwise they sit around all day, they think about it too much, mm -hmm. they get lethargic. This way they get up, have breakfast, you know, start getting into the game mode a little bit, get their pregame working, even though in a conference tournament you don't hit on the field. I think they prefer to play right away. This is a really good at bat by Mike Gurley. Oh yeah, he was right on that one. Blast of that ball. And that got yeah, Ty. Same. You were right, Ty. You were right about Gurley. He looks really comfortable against Lanier right there. Like that's the second time he's faced him, I think. But he does look really comfortable, even though it's a lefty lefty. Mike had started to stay in on pitches better there that those last couple of weeks. A lot of guys had, you know, they they were able to stay stay up the middle, not try to do too much. Um, and just guys seem to simplify their swings a little bit. And, and we started to just get a little bit more momentum offensively those last couple of weeks of the regular season. And then um, we were just waiting for it to kind of explode. I think, I think we all knew we had the, the capabilities of doing a lot of damage, but it was a matter of, you know, when it was going to happen. Great bump by Alex right there. Yeah, it was really good. Killed that thing in between. There's that little subtle, like, just receive it at the last second, Ed, that you guys try to teach them, you know? Notice where his foot placement was. He was yeah. up, in front of, was up in the front part of the box to take home plate out of the equation a little bit. Otherwise, too many bunters bunt the ball off home plate, mm -hmm. which gives an advantage to the defense. So, well, Jake has a pretty good at bat here, too. Um, that's a lot of pressure on a freshman right now, you know, runner in scoring position. We're in the middle part of the game. You got a tough left-hander and you're, you're supposed to drive him in, you know? So he, he has a good at bat. You know, one thing about Jake, you know, he didn't back away from a competitive situation. He, he, this was up to this point. This was the biggest at bat of the game. Yeah. <clears throat> But after his last at bat, too, where he had, has a runner on second with two outs and he puts together such a great at bat, you know, he, he wants another shot at it. He, he's like, you know, let me, let me try to drive this guy in right here again and, and just to continue to put together quality ABs. Um, 
You can tell he's seen it well, too, because he hasn't even come close to offering any of this stuff. You'll see his body language when he makes contact because um, it's 3-0 and all now, so it's going to be a strike here, and then it goes to 3-1, and he puts the ball in play. His body language is he just missed it. Hitters will let you know when they just miss it. They'll do something coming out of the batter's box, which indicates I should have done more with that pitch than I did. Mm. This is the pitch I believe he puts into play here. He hits a ground ball a second. But um, he was disappointed. He should have done more with it because it was a good pitch. Oh, yeah. Just kind of rolled it over a little bit. Yeah, yeah just, just a smidge late. You tell how he hit the bag. He hit the bag like, dang it, I had a chance there to drive that run in. Mm. See, he clapped his hands there. Yeah, so. He's got the clap right there. <laughs> A lot of emotion in these games. You know, he's a freshman, so that's that's his first. Ex this is his first experience of a conference tournament, and there's a lot of adrenaline coming in. And then, you know, just the emotion that's that he's got there. Now they made a mistake here, uh, Ty. Watch, you know, Manaya had a fat. He threw a fastball there. This is Brennan Murphy. Yeah, there's a new in the program, you know, a really athletic guy. Only had two extra base hits the entire year. Yeah. He was a full-time starter for us. He hits that ball off his shin. And if I'm Manaya, I come back in with another fastball. He throws a loopy breaking ball over the plate. Murph hits it over the shortstop's head, you know, for the first run of the game. Yeah. And he did him a favor by throwing him that. Um, I don't know why he did. I mean, we're happy he did. Because I yeah. think if he throws his fastball inside, Murph's going to have a hard time with it. Yeah, that, that's our nine-hole hitter right there coming up really big and with two outs. Um, you know, like you said, Coach, he, he kind of struggled a little bit offensively, but we all knew that he had great potential. And for him to come through with that hit, I just remember thinking that that's when the floodgates were going to start to open for our team offensively. Like the whole attitude of the dugout, everybody's just at the top step. You can see everybody yeah. – you know, smile in there. Here, the, here comes the failed pickoff. That ends up being a tough situation for him now. Oh, he just drops it. See how the yep. shortstop ran with the ball in his glove. Ty, oh, what are you talking wow. about? You're caught in a rundown. Get Always the ball out of your glove as quick as possible. Don't <laughs> run with it in your glove. The oh, shortstop wow. runs three or four steps, and now that gives us an opportunity. So yep. the inning should be over right now. Yep. Yes. Ty, what goes through your mind as a pitcher? How do you have to – because you have to put that out of your mind and pitch through if a guy makes an error or something bad happens. Manaya is unable to do so, and we can watch that as this unfolds. He ends up walking the next two guys to load the bases and compound the damage. Yeah, you, you try to sometimes as a pitcher do too much in that situation because you're like, well, man, I, I just did what I, what I could do, you know, picking this guy off, but then we can't get him out. So then he's like, well, I'm going to try to strike these guys out now. He starts, you know, maybe trying to overthrow pitches or, or, you know, put too much snap on a breaking ball. And you start to miss a little bit more. And then it's hard to find that rhythm again. And, you know, he, he knows that they're down a run now. And uh, it's going to be a tight game. And so he's he's trying to, to do his part. But sometimes you try to do too much as a pitcher, which I think is what happened. He's only a sophomore at this point, so he's still trying to trying to you know learn through some of these big situations um, in, in these kind of conference tournaments, uh, big games, and it's hard to control your emotions. I'm a little surprised he never went and picked it first again. Yeah, yeah, you just picked him off, and then he doesn't do it again because why, he's wouldn't, got you, no why wouldn't you go back? Because he's he got no confidence. Yeah, like how is it? You got no confidence in that. Chance Ross, the inning before. I'm I'm surprised he did not. It doesn't make any sense to me why you do not go back. Um, and even though we weren't getting big leads at first, Chance didn't get a big lead either. He picked him off, and big leads pitching him off. He tried back, to, would you, Ty? If you were out there, I would have went back there. Well, in his mind, yeah. he just saw his guys execute a relay from first to second, a three-man relay, yeah. and. Yeah. And the second time they dropped the ball chasing them, so like he probably has no confidence in their execution either at this point. Because he looked really frustrated after that ball dropped. Like his body language was not good after that. Yeah, he, he lets his emotions get the best of him. I think they come out, have a little visit here, yeah. try to calm him 
down, but he's visibly upset. You know, mm-hmm. you start missing pitches that bad, high arm side, you you can tell that a guy's upset, and the offense feeds off that. Um, so the hitters, you know, Brad took a great swing that at bat. He just missed smashing the ball uh, on a you know a good pitch down in the zone, and you know the hitters see that emotion. They see when a pitcher is frustrated, upset, not comfortable. And when the hitters can start to feel that, that's when things can get really hairy as for a pitcher. Uh, you just have a hard time, uh, you know, swinging the momentum back your way because the, when, when those guys with the bat start feeling like they've got confidence, it's hard to get them out. You know, even though the score is only one to nothing, it has a feel of about a four to five run game. Yeah, right? no, now, exactly. Games are interesting that way. They just have a different feel to it. Even though you look up at the scoreboard and it says one to nothing, geez, it feels like we've got a bigger lead than that. Mm-hmm. I think Indiana State felt that way. And that's why they kind of came apart a little bit here in this inning. I think they felt like even though the scoreboard read one nothing, it felt like it was four or five to nothing. I was going to mention Absolutely. before, sorry, before Brennan – um, drop that ball in there like it's 0-0 zero, zero and you got a man on third but it feels like you're already up like it feels like you're winning the game even though you're not actually winning the game because the hitters were having better at bats mm-hmm. they were just staying within themselves they were, they were taking pitches better I always look at our hitters and they can tell me a lot about how they take a pitch it's not oftentimes the contact they make it's how well they're seeing the ball and, and, they're, and they're taking pitches just off the edge look at that pitch I mean, that's just off the edge. Probably was a strike. But Nick is locked in. 2-0, he's looking for something that he can either give us a, you know, a two to, to a four run lead right there. Uh, Nick had, had some power. and He's just looking for a ball that he can drive. Uh, truth be known, Ty, he was probably taking that pitch. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Because so yeah, Sean just, Manaya just walked the previous batter. So Nick's taking that 2-0, knowing that, you know, he hasn't thrown a strike for a while. So we're going to make this guy work. He's, he took that 3-0, but he was still on it from a timing perspective. You see that fake swing. Now he's he swinging here. He's swinging here if it's a pitch. But he, that's, a, that's an easy one to recognize. And now we got our hottest hitter coming up in yeah. Chance Ross. Yeah, Chance had really just started to, to find his timing on everything the last couple of weekends. It just seemed like he was starting to barrel a whole lot of baseballs. And I think we all knew that, too. And, and so coming in, we're, we're excited about where we are and the opportunity that we have to, to, to bust this game open. Ty, how lonely is that mound when you, you know, just got done with a visit, you feel like the inning should be over, and then you walk the next guy to load the bases and you have to keep going? Like, how lonely does that mound feel at that point? It, you just it just starts going really fast um like your thought process just you know early on in the game you're like okay i'm just going to make a pitch i'm going to execute and then all of a sudden like things start spinning and it's just going faster and faster and faster and, and now you see that they're warming guys up in the bullpen so you're trying to do too much now because you're like no you know i'm the ace like it's the conference tournament i'm supposed to get deep in this game so He's got a lot of emotion, a lot of thought process, um, trying to trying to harness some of that, and it's really difficult to do mm-hmm. um, in this situation. Nice poke. Just didn't try to do too much with it. We almost made another base running mistake there, but you guys are super jacked up though. Look at everybody out there. It's only the second run. That's kind of Creighton baseball though. When, they, when there's a chance to celebrate, at least in the in the eight years I've seen them, they get a little up, especially in a, in a game like this. You see a game that conference tournament, they're out there celebrating. You get a three zero lead. Yeah, you, you could see you could see Sean's head right there. He just he's just really deflated you know he, it's he's dropped down as soon as that ball goes past him he knows it's up the middle and you know that that the offense feeds off that you know you, you get that three run lead right there and I'm just like man let's let's get this thing rolling you know I, like I was happy with one run and now I've got three and <laughs> and 
And so it, it's, it's really fun because the guys feed on that. They know, they know when their pitcher's going well and they can score some runs, everybody gets really excited. The team gets jacked up and that's kind of what happened this whole tournament. Ty, I got, I got two questions for you. One, I, I want you to put yourself in, in the shoes of Manaya, and then I want, want you to answer about a question about how you feel in this moment. But do you notice when the bullpen gets up when you're on the mound? If you're in a game, do you know that? And, and how does that change? I know you said they got it up, but as you're the pitcher, do you look out and see the bullpen? Yeah, when, when things start going – going bad and you start uh, feeling like you're losing a little bit of confidence or losing effectiveness, you're always looking over your shoulder um, because as a, as an athlete, you don't want them to take the ball out of your hand. You're a competitor. You want that ball no matter what. So you almost get a little bit of like frustration, like especially him. He's like, it's only the fifth inning. Like I've only given up one run at this point and they're already getting the bullpen going so he's frustrated there and, and it's almost like a lack of confidence uh even though that's not what it is because as a, as a coach like you you have to to limit as much damage as possible in that situation so you have to be prepared but sometimes as an athlete you uh you don't see those things in the moment and they can definitely get the best of you now flip it as you're going out to the mound to throw your warm-up pitches You've just been given three runs. And also, you had put together two really great innings, 11-pitch inning and 10-pitch inning. What's going through your mind? Yeah, I just was starting to feel like there was a good rhythm going, and the defense was making some great plays. You know, obviously, Judkins going and catching that ball. Um, yeah, the outfielders made a couple of really nice catches uh, a couple of those innings before a uh, ball hit to left that Brad came in on really nice. There was a ball in the first inning that, that – Murph ran down, uh, made a nice play on. And so you're feeling really confident that they're going to make plays. And when you see an offense that has struggled as much as we did that year, uh, put up three runs against a guy like Manaya, especially after he had thrown 12 shutout innings against us in a game earlier on the year, uh, you're just – you're doing everything you can to get them back in the dugout to, to hit because they're pumped up right now. And everybody's out there in the field right now thinking about their next at bat and how they can't wait to get up there. So I didn't even mention the pitcher of the year, Nick Petrie. I remember that guy. And <laughs> yeah, Nick ran off like 90s consecutive scoreless innings or something like that. It was crazy. Really? Oh my God. I, I want to say it was maybe 80 something without giving up an earned run. What? Yeah. It's wild. Was Detweiler pitching now, or was he before this? He was before this. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is a big inning because, you know, Ty, we always say when we score, you know, you want to make sure the other team doesn't. And what you're trying to do is get your team back in the dugout as quick as possible. So, oftentimes, the biggest inning is not the ninth inning of a ball game. It's after your team scores, you go out there and you have to throw a zero to maintain that uh, momentum. So good start to this inning with a ground ball to Jake. Mm. Yeah, you just got, uh, you got a quick look at their body language there, but it didn't look good in their dugout at Indiana State. Yeah, they're, they're searching too offensively. They, mm -hmm. They've had a couple of good swings, but as a pitcher, you can tell um, when the hitters are on the defensive and, and they're not coming out attacking. And, you know, like the, the swings are timid. They're tentative. Nice job by Mike taking charge there. Can you talk about Gerber a little bit in center field? Because I still have not seen a guy that can just like – it's an auto out if it's anywhere in the vicinity of center field. Like he just, he just glides to the ball. Like what's yeah. it like playing with him in center field? He played, he played some center field for me this last year in AAA, and it's like, thank goodness he was out there. But he was going to be way higher. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's Nick again making yep. a great play. I think that was yeah. I think that was five pitch inning, wasn't it, Ty? I think mm -hmm. that was a five pitch inning. It was six. Uh, I mean six. Exactly what you want. And they did have some favors by swinging at the first pitch, last two batters. So that's perfect. Yeah, we we gave that last guy a fastball because we're thinking, well, we just had a four pitch at bat. 
And then the guy gets out on a first pitch changeup, and it's like, well, we're going to attack right here and, and get it, get ahead in this count. And he swings and he puts a pretty good swing on it, but Nick's right there, makes a great play. Um, but yeah, going back to Mike, what, what he does out there in the outfield is, is he gives you confidence as a pitcher that, uh, especially playing at a ballpark like TD Ameritrade, where you can let a guy try to hit it as far as he can to center field and it's not going to go anywhere and know that Mike's going to catch anything in the air that hangs up. And not only that, but he's got a great arm too. Yeah. Uh, he's able to limit balls that are, that do get down. They're not going to get to third base because he's going to hit that cutoff man, or he's going to have a chance to throw a guy out. If there's a ball that, that drops in front of him uh, trying to score. So what he does defensively is so valuable and then not to mention uh, what he can do offensively. Um, here's another look at this play by Nick. Just mm -hmm. as a pitcher, uh, you can see I'm fired up right there. Yeah, you've right got – I mean, between Nick and Chance and Alex and then – and Mike, like, you've had some good defensive plays in this game. Some ones that, like, boost you up a little bit, I imagine, right? Not Absolutely. Think about, the, think about the defense in general. You've got a gold glover at first base – you guys have already talked about how well Chance played third base. Staley was more than adequate at shortstop, and Jake was a good second baseman. And you could argue that outfield was one of the best that, that coach you've seen when you've got Brad McEwen out in left field, uh, and you've got Gerber in center, and Murphy was very athletic out in right field. So you've got one of the best outfields. I, actually, I'd I be interested to hear your take. What was your best defensive outfield? Well, that, that was good because they were all athletic. Um, you know, we had a we had a pretty good outfield two years ago with uh, Will Robertson and Will Hannafin and Parker Upton out there too, and mm -hmm. that was displayed in the regional out in Corvallis when they made three or four really really yeah Parker was ridiculous. Yeah. So and and we had a great center fielder in Clark Brinkman when Clark was here, a draft choice by the Tigers. So we've been blessed, you know. A lot of people when they think about our defense. They give a lot of credit to our infielders, and, and rightly so, but we've had some excellent, excellent outfield play. Daniel Woodrow in center field. Mm -hmm. Again, double triple A with the Tigers. We've been blessed with some really, really great center field play. But this was a good outfield, no doubt. Very athletic. And even though Brennan Murphy struggled a little bit defensively, he was really, really good. I mean, offensively, he was really, really good defensively. Those athletic outfielders playing in a park that is as big as TD Ameritrade um, all the time because what happens is you see it at, at you know places like Coors Field, places that have really big outfields. Um, you get hurt more by the balls that drop in than, than the balls that go over guys' heads. So you've got to play so deep in some of those places that they've got to be able to cover a ton of ground to get to the gaps and, and get to balls that are going to drop in. And that's huge as a pitcher when a ball that should be an out is an out. I can remember so many times just watching. I wonder if you guys even, like, stole a hit or two from a team. Like, because you watch Mike or, you know, we're talking about Gerber in center field and, like, the way he – the way he can get to a ball and how much ground he can cover and how he reads it off the bat and everything, like – he could play shallower and still catch up to some things that are over his head. That was a nice swing. Alex always loved that high end fastball. Yeah. Alex, <laughs> he was a dead pull hitter, wasn't he? He was a dead pull hitter. <laughs> he loved to pull the baseball. Got a lot of doubles down that left field corner. But, you know, and he does. You're right, Matt, about Mike. You know, a lot of outfielders do not like to go back on the ball, they right. prefer to go in, so they play deeper. Mike had no problems going back. So that allowed him to take a lot of those line drive base hits, a lot of those sinking line drive base hits away because he played as shallow as any center fielder we had mm -hmm. because he had, the, he had the ability to go back. So that's, that's another separator for Mike is he was very comfortable, comfortable can, going back on a ball. I can imagine Ty is like looking out there and seeing where he, how close Gerber is to him and just thinking, you're crazy, man. Like, <laughs> I had a comment from one of one of our pitchers this last year in AAA when I was playing with Mike. He's like, man, I gave up this this ball to center field, but he's like, I was looking back and Gerber was like already moving. He's like, half the time, you know, you don't see outfielders get that good of reads. Um, mm -hmm. um, 
where he's even moving before the, the ball's even hit sometimes. He's that good at reading the way the hitter's swinging the bat, yeah. uh, the way the bat is his own. And that's huge as a, as a pitcher when you've got a guy that's, that's tracking down balls like that, um, just making incredible plays for you. Yeah. I think if I'm not mistaken, Detroit had a DH because they weren't sure about his arm at first, right? And then they finally realized he can read like nobody's business in the outfield, right? Is that am I mistaken on that, Ed? Yeah, I'm not sure what um I, I think Mike had some arm issues there for a while. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. As he got closer to the big leagues. I think he did have some shoulder issues. Um, so that might have been one of the reasons, but you know, he won a gold glove. Mike won a gold glove in the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why Detroit would have been hesitant throwing him out in the outfield. But if my if my recall is correct, I think he had a little bit of a shoulder issue. Gotcha. That was a good bounce back inning right there by by Minaya, just be, being able to to kind of settle himself down. Um, sometimes you have that rough inning as a pitcher, and and things get spinning. You know, it, you give up some runs, and if you're not able to settle down, you're out of that game in a hurry, and you give up a bunch more runs that next inning. So uh, he was able to uh, to kind of settle in. Obviously, Alex had that great swing, but to get out get out of that and get a zero that puts the pressure a little bit back on me to come out and, and throw up another zero. Yeah. Cause I guess if he settles in and you relax a little bit and let their offense get going then the game flips, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we had struggled in a lot of games late and they knew that too. So they're saying, Hey, if we can just hold it at three, we still got an opportunity because, you know, Creighton had struggled a little bit in many games late. So um, this is why this, this sixth inning, seventh inning are big that Ty can still go out there and get us back in the dugout as quick as possible, keep his pitch count down. So we can not only try to be successful in this game, but set ourselves up for the next one. It looks like we know, we know we got to win the whole thing. We got to win the whole thing. So we're trying to win this game and then prepare for the next one at the same time. It looks like you found a pretty consistent release point, Ty. I don't think you're missing. I haven't seen you miss much in the last couple of frames. Yeah, you you get into that rhythm where you're just kind of getting it and going. And there's not a lot of time in between innings here, this last inning, this inning. And and you're able to kind of sustain that rhythm as a pitcher. Um, And I I was always trying to be really simple and work quick. Uh, Just let the defense make plays. There he is again. Yeah, yeah. There, there he was again, sticking his head <laughs> <in> his head. <laughs> oh, yeah, see? Well, what's funny about that is, like, he – you missed worse on that one than the one he actually got to first base on. Yeah. The other one was, like, right over the plate, he leaned over, got it. This was big in this game, though, because that's one out. You got a runner on first, um, you know, and all of a sudden uh, they've got a little bit of momentum offensively on a free base. Yeah. Um, With some so speed to, on the bat. Yeah. It was a big momentum booster, kind of deflates them a little bit more. And you went right back to that same spot, too, with the fastball <laughs> this time, but you went to the spot. Yeah, he couldn't, he couldn't stick his arm out at that one. <laughs> You know what's interesting, Ty, is your mannerisms are the same now as as they were when you were pitching back then. You know, I mean, it's it, you're you're. I don't know if you even notice it, but everything's the same. Your manner, how you catch the ball back from the catcher, what do you do between pitches? When I saw you pitch last year, you know, it's the same. You're just a little. Obviously, you're eight years older, a little thicker, but your mannerisms <laughs> are the same. And I think it's I think it's I think it's pretty cool. And you still like to work fast. You have to. I can't believe they didn't try to slow you down a little bit. You know, like a lot of teams tried to do. Yeah, Missouri State was always was always trying to slow us down. 
he would the the coach over at Missouri State would give signs with with two outs, two strikes, and nobody on base to their hitter to step and out just, and just be given really deliberate signs just to try to keep us out of the room as a pitcher. <laughs> this would be him at third base, and we're just sitting over there, just like, all right, come on, man. <laughs> Nice pick by Alex. Ooh, nice play. Yeah, that's uh that's above average play there on both ends. Yeah. Nick did a good job going out and getting the baseball too. Yeah, for I don't ball, Nick doesn't look that big. Doesn't look that tall, but he can stretch there. Yeah, that's the that's the benefit of that is he's got that flexibility, but you know, the, the crazy thing about that was Alex didn't pick that ball clean. He actually – it actually bounced up off of his glove and he fielded it again and then was able to continue it into the throw. Oh, he actually and, got and, it before it went down again? Yes. Oh, wow. And if he doesn't do that, the runner's safe right there. Um, I, I just remember talking to him after that. Like, that was incredible just the, to stay with it because that backhand in the hole is one of the hardest plays of the shortstop. And when you don't get it clean, a lot of the time you don't even have a chance at throwing a guy out. So he picked that ball twice and then was able to make an accurate throw to where Nick could to stay on the bag. Nice. Yeah, he could do it because he had arm strength. Alex could throw the ball. Alex yeah. had a good arm, had a plus arm. This is about the point in the game where we're really gonna show it again now. I'll show you. Watch how he plays oh, it. Oh, you're right. Wow. Yeah. When we start making plays like that, we kind of figured it was our day today. Because that's a that's one we didn't practice very often in, in, in practice, I don't think, Ty. <laughs> no, no. But it's one of those that he's in the right position still with his body and he's got his momentum moving towards first base still uh, that he's able to, to collect himself and, and gather and make a strong throw. Something that you always taught is if you don't have it clean, you're still moving towards first base. You're cutting down that distance. And if he's not doing that right there, he, that guy's not going to be uh, out at first. I like these college I you strikes. Know, though, this, this does show how good or like how talented Benaya is, though, because he has not pitched well and he's in the seventh. It just shows, his, it just shows, it shows his ability to make – to just use his talent and get an out. Absolutely. Another good poke that's, by Brandon. But That's another good indicator that it was our day. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we're getting a lot of production out of the bottom of the lineup there. Murphy, right. that's his second hit. And yeah. uh, he didn't look overmatched at all against the tough, tough left-hander. And that's oh, tough to defend, to too, because I think he went – I think he went middle middle away. Yeah, he went to left center with the base hit. Yeah, with the base hit, and then this one he pulls. Yeah. What do you think Brad's going to do here, Ty? Uh, let me guess. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes the butt. <laughs> yeah. Coach, what, what's the mindset, though? You're, you're trying to, to squeeze across that fourth run. Anything particular about it or just trying to get one more run to push, it, push the lead? Something about a four-run lead that then it takes a grand slam to tie it. You know, it, it, it takes a lot of the situation stuff away from the offense, you know, they're not going to, they're, they're not going to bunt with runners on first and second. They've got it. They've got to get to, you know, to, to four to tie. So when you take away options from the offense, it allows your defense to be better. You know, if the defense knows what the offense is going to do, as we almost get picked again by Murphy. That move is sick when you look at it from this angle. I mean, he's going, look at him. He's going, he's going to offer. He's leaning to the ball. We always try to get a four-run lead. Now there's a good bunt by Brad. Mm -hmm. All right, Coach, I'm going to pick on who's your first base coach right here because uh, I, I, I got some questions for him. 
John Moore, his name was, remember Ty, John? John Moore is his name, and, and uh, he played his collegiate baseball at Purdue. And um, I, I believe he's no longer in coaching, but he's, uh, he also worked with our outfielders. So he was an outfielder himself when he was a, a player at Purdue. Yeah. Now, Nick was, Nick was really good at working counts. You know, Nick would rarely swing at the first pitch. He liked to work counts. Really a, an ideal two-hole hitter in many respects. He was one of the guys that year that didn't matter the, the situation or how tough things were for the team. He was one of the guys that we always had confidence in through the whole season. I think he had a pretty good year offensively and – you just knew that he was always going to put together a quality at bat, no matter week in, week out, what situation it was. Just a real, really good baseball player. He mm -hmm. had a good feel for the game of baseball. Absolutely. And he never backed away. He always played with that chip on his shoulder. He had that little extra fire. I think uh, just I think that's what always made him so good is he just was always always grinding like always wanted more and never was satisfied. Yeah, that's that's a tough take right there. Yeah, for sure, especially on O two count. Manaya is probably thinking to himself, what do I got to do to get this guy out? That's a great pitch. Absolutely. You make that pitch right there as a pitcher, you're like, geez, like I could get that call. Like how does he not swing at that? He didn't have a good feel for his breaking ball that day. You know, he didn't yeah. show a lot of breaking balls for strike. Nick knew that. So now Nick is sitting on one pitch right now. Let's see if he gets it. He's having trouble getting anything for a strike on the inner half, whether it's breaking ball or fastball right now. Oh. I that don't was, know. That was, a weird, that was a weird throw. He's going to the middle and he, he tries that jump throw. Doesn't get anything on it. Yeah, it looks, like he, it looks like he pushed it a little bit. Great play to keep the ball in the infield, though. It was. Oh, yeah, he's off the bag. Wow. Yeah, That's that another one of those little mistakes as a, as a first baseman that you, you can't make that right there. He's got to be on the bag. I know it's it's not easy when the throw is floating like that, but he was never on the bag. Yeah. And then he just searched for it. This is probably is this it for him right here, the Yankee now? I think they give him one out beforehand. I think he goes six and a third. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like that guy's probably like six four, six five. Nick looks more in the six who six one range, and he's stretching out for those balls and as opposed to that. That's what I mean. Nick makes Nick makes Nick Nick makes plays that it looks like he's taller than he is. He probably could have hung on the bags there. Yeah, the first baseman didn't do the second baseman any favors. Heller's at Iowa right now, right? Yes. How come you guys don't play them very much? Well, a lot of, yeah. A lot of it has to match up with schedules. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're about four and a half hours away from, from uh, Iowa City, so it's – just a, it's a little tough for a midweek game. Oh, yeah. You know? I feel like we've had them on the schedule three or four times over the years for midweek games. And it, with, with the weather that we have, inevitably, I've, I've actually never gone to Iowa, and I would have gone to one of those games. And I don't recall them coming to us more than once or twice. And I feel like that we haven't actually played those games. Whenever they've been on the schedule – uh, baseball hasn't actually gotten to to be played, so. Mm. 
I remember sitting in the dugout right here just thinking, man, we can get one or two more runs. Like, I'm going the distance with this thing. We're just going to shut the door. You know, when you're in that rhythm as a pitcher, it makes it a lot of fun uh, when when you can start building on these leads because it just deflates the other team so much. And I knew we were just, you know, one more, two more runs away from really demoralizing them. Yeah, Ch- Chance is feeling pretty good right now. He's <laughs> he'd probably swing at a ball right there because he's he's feeling like, hey, I want to drive in this fourth run. So I'm going to open up my zone a little bit. I'm going to expand it to drive it in. He's a hard guy to double off. So if Chance were to hit a ground ball in the middle of the field, there's a real good chance that that runner at third is going to be able to score. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just. Now you can tell Manai is not feeling good right now. He he's cannot not locate. Good. He cannot locate that part uh, part of the plate at all. He's trying to get an out at first base. He's picking the first base a little bit. He's also trying to. He's also thinking we may suicide squeeze here. Mm. So by picking the first, he's trying to get chance to tip his hand a little bit with potentially showing bunt. Ooh, nice hit. Oh, golf swing. Again, that wasn't a strike. But no. chance is feeling it right now. You can tell he's got he's in he's one of those days when he's feeling it. Because yeah. he swings two pitches that were not strikes. Just got the barrel on it, poke it in. Yeah, I wish we would have got the center field uh, view on that because that ball may have bounced if it would have not been swaying at before it got to the catcher. It was that, it, that, it was that down. <laughs> he was always really good at just dropping the, the bat head. He That was kind of his swing path was, was just kind of that down one. And uh, whenever he could get something down in that wheelhouse, he just always seemed to to really – thrive in those situations. Ed, you got a dude right here in your ace that got hits off of Kershaw in the major leagues. Was he your best hitter on this team right here? <laughs> yeah. Well, he'd come back for the alumni games and win the home run hitting contest. Really? <laughs> I when we never let him hit. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Ty would come up to me eh, maybe once or twice and say, you know, I, I'd like to try hitting this year. And I'd say, well, let's, let's stay with the pitching. Let's stay with the pitching stuff. <laughs> By far your worst coaching decision, not letting Ty rake. Yeah, him. as he got older, he got more comfortable. He'd say, yeah, you know, I could, I could probably DH. I don't want to play center field anymore, but I could DH. Yeah. And I kind of liked him a little bit as a pitcher, so we kind of said that. Uh, <laughs> I get the hit off of Kershaw and just text Ed like a shrug. <laughs> like, <"Hold laughs> Ty, when you, were, when you were with the Giants – there's a couple of hit, couple of pitchers who could swing it. What it was some of those discussions like in the dugout when Baumgartner was get a hold of a of a ball, or when you got a hold of the ball? What's it like in the in the major league clubhouse when the pitchers get a hit? Well, Madison Baumgartner had more power than anybody on our team. He, he hit balls and batting further than any any hitter that we'd have. Um, he was consistently hitting the concourse, the AT and T Park, and left field hitting home runs to center field with ease and batting practice, which not many guys can do there. And so it was never any fun to hit batting practice with him because he'd get mad if you didn't hit a homer. <laughs> and I don't have that much power. You know, I got lucky on one swing in the big leagues, but uh, he, he would just – like he consistently could, could drive balls out of the ballpark. Jeff Samarja was the same way. Uh, you know, big, strong guy, athletic, just tons and tons of power. So – Hitting BP with those guys is never any fun as I'm as I'm just trying to hit line drives to right field. They're just hitting balls 30 or 40 feet. <laughs> you I say you just, remember getting a text from Coach Service after after getting two hits off Kershaw and uh, pretty sure all the text said, well, maybe I should have let you hit when you were here. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I, I got a pretty good kick out of that one. That is funny. Good take by Boomer right there. Mm-hmm. 
that was quick. Yeah, I think they're concerned. You know, they're probably changing up sign systems. Yeah. Um, he's he's had a couple of pretty good good takes. You know, good swings to set bat. They think you know maybe maybe they're switching up the sign system, or uh, they're maybe even trying to give somebody in the bullpen his pitch count's really probably starting to extend right here. So just give him a breather. Boomer comes up big with a nice swing. Yeah, that was right on that barrel. Perfect. Ed, was there any thought of sending him there? Not that it would have been a good idea, but what was the thought through your mind? I wish I would have now that I saw the throw. <laughs> it not very well at all. But it was like a two-hopper to him. Yeah, that's tough. Right at him. And, you know, the, the, the key is when you're coaching third in that situation, did your runner get to the base before the outfielder got to the ball? If the outfielder has the ball before your runner gets to that base, that's normally when you shut them down. We only have one out, and I'm thinking, okay, we got a chance to ha have a big inning. I don't want to get thrown out at the plate and take away an opportunity here. we got the middle of our lineup coming up. Um, so all those things factor in. But my guess is that that's Robbie Ord out in right field. He's their, one of their best players. My guess is he got the ball before Nick got to third base. And if that happened, had, had to freeze too because that ball was hit so low and so hard that Nick had to freeze. I, I remember sitting there in the dugout thinking the same thing, but Nick had to freeze when that ball was hit just in case it was hit right at the second baseman. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get the jumps. <clears throat> was uh, What was Anthony like in terms of working with you and – situations where he just had to go out and tell you something real quick to calm you down or whatnot. Was he good? Yeah, Anthony was great. His understanding of the game uh, was awesome. He's a, he's a really fiery guy. Uh, I think he's, he's, his demeanors maybe changed a little bit, and that's probably helped him, but he was always a very fiery player in college. Um, quiet, but, like, you could tell, like, there was a lot of, lot of energy there. Uh, and I think now – now, as, as I've seen him play, he's still got that fire, but he's also got a little bit of that calmness to him as well. So uh, he was always really good back there behind the plate, understanding what we were feeling, trying to get us to slow down, trying to get us to, to just stay in the, in the moment, um, not try to overdo. Uh, he was really good about reminding us how good our defense was and just, just hey, you know, work quick, execute pitches, and let these guys make plays. Gotcha. This is a pretty spacious field. It feels a little bit. I mean, I don't know what the dimensions are or anything, but I imagine you guys are pretty comfortable here. It's actually a good offensive ballpark. Is it really? Yeah, down the lines, it's very, very friendly. Um, so it, it's it, it's an offensive friendly ballpark, especially at this time of year when the weather's warmed up. This day was a perfect day. It was in the mid to upper 70s. There wasn't a lot of wind a good day to play a game but the ball will jump a little bit down the lines they'll get a good breeze not, it's not quite as offensive as prasco though doesn't it? But... <laughs> no ty would quit baseball if you had to pitch at prasco i pitched in the pcl last year so did you really? <laughs> i don't know i don't know if that uh <laughs> what's that, that like i can't i don't know how you guys like mentally handle a ballpark that is just like built for bombs you pitch in you pitch in Reno, you pitch in Salt Lake City, El Paso, Albuquerque. The middle of summer when it's hot, you get these these winds that are blowing twenty miles an hour straight out at these high elevation parks. Las Vegas, Las Vegas has has one of the highest elevation parks in the country now this year, and it just the ball just jumps out of there. That I think we had a game where the winds were blowing over sixty miles an hour straight out to center field. What? And it's just – you can't do anything as a pitcher if a ball can sit in the air. <gasps> that's crazy. That's that's just a great execution by Scott right there. He's got two strikes on him, gets a tough sinker in on his hands, but he's able to somehow put it in play, and it gets us a run. You know, that that's, that's what we started doing here in this tournament that – 
we hadn't done a lot of during the year was was make things happen on stuff like that. So, I mean, Ty, you said you were waiting for four to feel like you could shut the door. What's five feel like right now? Yeah, I'm, I like now I'm like, all right, get me back out there. You know, it's like you, you, you want to drive in these couple, go ahead, and then then this game's over. Um, but we're definitely excited, you know, just to, to get back out there now. And you like as a pitcher, you know, you, you alluded to it earlier, you feel when you start to get that rhythm uh, talking – you know, I, I think I knew that I had retired however many in a row or, you know, had had so many one, two, three innings where it's quick and you feel really fresh still. Mm. Um, and that's that's the key in those situations is feeling like you can go out and make pitches still because then your defense is going to be able to work quick, make plays, uh, and just let them do all the work, which is all I really tried to do in this game. Uh, just let those infielders make as many plays as possible. So, Ed, as you're getting ready to, like – well, you're probably thinking how to get more runs across right now, but in the back of your mind when you're thinking about approaching the bottom of the seventh in these last nine outs here, are you are you trying to think about what's the plan B if Ty starts to scuffle a little bit, or are you just thinking let the let him finish it at this point? No, we're counting outs. We know we got nine outs to get. We're looking at Ty's um, pitch count. We're saying, okay, you know, if he can, if he can throw, you know, and get 15 pitches and get three outs, I think he can complete the game. Then I'm looking at who he's got to face, you know, with nine outs. It, does he have to face like Robbie Ort? Is Ort going to get up potentially twice if they get a mm-hmm. base runner? Is Ort going to get up twice? How's tied down against Rob Ort? Those are things that are going through your mind as you're coaching third. But when I get later in the game, I'm always counting outs and saying, okay, can this pitcher give us four or five outs? In Ty's case, we knew he was fresh, that the weather wasn't too hot that day. Um, He was getting stronger as the game went on. Can we extend him, and can he complete the game? Because then it sets us up really well to go after game two, which is always really the most important game in a conference tournament. You've got to win game two to really have a legitimate chance. And it really sets us up to go after game two with a rested bullpen. And we had Shane Liska sitting there uh, as the game two starter. So, um, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling like Ty's going to give us, out of those nine outs, he's going to give us at least five or six. Mm-hmm. Best case scenario is he gives us all nine. Gotcha. And Ty's thinking, I'm not giving this ball up for my life, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I had pitched in the conference tournament. I had pitched in that game too, like Coach Service had alluded to the year before, yeah. um, when we were at the Ameritrade, and we had a weird situation that year with, uh, you know, the we had gotten rained out the first night of the tournament, um, and so we played at eight a.m. the next day, and then we were told that we weren't going to play till the next day, but then they ended up squeezing our game two in at like ten o'clock at night, and didn't pitch very well. Um, it was just one of those situations and I knew how important it was to have a rested bullpen, uh, in order to come back through. Um, if, if you were going to be in any kind of losers bracket, uh, have how we did the year before coming through that tournament, um, you have to have as many guys fresh as possible. So I knew we had three or four really good bullpen arms this year. We had Mark Winkleman, Kurt Spomer, Reese McGraw, Chase Webb, um, some of these guys that had some some really good success out of the bullpen. So if I could give those guys a day off, uh, I knew it was going to set us up so much better for the next two or three days of the tournament uh, because those guys wouldn't have to throw four or five games in a row. And so that's all I'm thinking at this point. We've got a five-run lead, do whatever I can to not make those guys have to pitch in this game or even throw any pitches in the bullpen because that can tax guys too. Sure. So – um, I just, I didn't even want them to get up. So I'm, I'm kind of challenging myself in the dugout, you know, just get, get as many outs as possible, you know, execute as many pitches as I can right here, let the defense make these plays and, and we'll see, see where we are, but trying to give those guys as much of a break as we can. Well, it's the difference between playing four games and six games. Absolutely. Like six games in, in 11 and we played four games in this tournament. 
and a lot of it had to do with the winning of the second game. Yes. So we lost the second game in 11. We had to play six. We won the second game in 12. We played four. Yep. That's 18 less innings that you got to put your pitchers through. So it, it, you, not only were we trying to win this game, but we were already saying, okay, we have to save our bullpen to give us the best chance against Illinois State in game two. Yes. So right now we just want you to throw it middle and have these guys get themselves out. That's what we're thinking. Just throw it in there like that. Throw every pitch like that and let them get themselves out so you can conserve your pitches and we can get on to the next game. Yeah, do you pitch to the score at all, Ty? Do you uh, – like I got five runs here. Maybe I can throw over the middle a few times with nobody on base. And Yeah, absolutely. You, because you have all the momentum. And like I was saying earlier – you could tell that these guys weren't swinging as aggressive as they had in the past. Um, you know, some of the times that we'd face them in the regular season, uh, you know, whether it was the pressure of being the number one seed or anything, uh, whatever it may, may have been, but you go out there and you're like, okay, like I am going to attack these guys and get ahead and just try to dictate as many counts as possible because the more ahead in the count you are, the weaker swings you're going to get. Mm. You know, so just pour in strike after strike and just stay on the offensive. And uh, the weaker swings you get, the easier the play it is for the defense. Now, here's their best hitter. You know, so the guy before him, Lucas, Jeremy Lucas and Robbie Ort were their best two hitters. Mm -hmm. So now we're sitting there going, okay, if we got nine outs to deal with, if we can eliminate a free base or a guy getting on base, we'll only have to see him one more time. Mm. that's what you look at later part of the game. So you're trying, you're trying to say, okay, now, now we got to get this guy out. If we can get yeah. this guy out, then there's a chance we don't see their best hitter in the ninth inning. Gotcha. And that's what you're trying to avoid. Was Lucas the player of the year that year? Or was I think Ort was, oh, okay. but it might've been Lucas. I mean, they were right there. Those two guys. Mm. Yeah. yeah I, I don't remember which one of them, but they were both really, really good. But it, like Coach was alluding to, you know, not letting their best hitter um, get up that, you know, that last time, that last inning. Earlier on in the year, I think it was my second or third start, we were playing at uh, University of Portland. And I was into the ninth inning, and it was the same kind of situation. We had, we had a two-run lead, and their best hitter was up fourth that inning. And I came in, and uh, I went out there for the ninth inning, and I walked the leadoff guy. And it allowed their best hitter to come up, and he hit a two-run homer to tie it against us, and they ended up beating us in extra innings, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's like little things like that that cost us a lot of games early on in the season. Uh, and we, we were trying to learn from those mistakes. So just trying to eliminate those kind of situations, not let them happen again to where we're going to get beat by their best players. Uh, and so I remember thinking about that during this game, like, you know, don't let these guys, you know, come up in a situation that's going to gonna allow you, them to beat you. It was Jeremy Lucas, player of the year. Yeah, okay. Right. Ty, who was the funniest player on this team? Funniest player on the team? Man. Uh, we had a lot of good characters on that team. Um I, I always – Mike always cracks me up. Uh, he, he's he's really quiet, Gerber. Um, so he's quiet, but he's got some good some good jokes from time to time. Um, we had we had some guys. You know, Alex Daly was always joking around. Uh, he he was a, he was pretty good. Mark Winkleman was another one that was that was pretty funny. Uh, those guys. But when it came down to game time, they were as serious as anybody. So. Um, you know, but off the field, those guys had to, like to have a lot of fun joking yeah. around. So. I, I remember Alex was – you talk about his fire. I remember I think – I think it was – so the fr I think it was the first year I covered the team. So it was the last year you guys played Valley teams, but you were playing Missouri State. <clears throat> I think they went – I think they went spikes up on a double play ball, and it got a little chippy. You know what I mean? Between the dugouts or whatever. And we were talking to Alex after the game. 
And I think it was funny because it was the first year I had done this stuff. So I hadn't heard anybody curse at that point. And it's baseball season now. So I've gone through like soccer, volleyball, uh, ba- basketball, and whatnot. And Alex is just like out there, just like we're talking about to the game. And he's just like, he's just so mad. Ooh. But they went spikes up. Like he still wants to fight everybody. And like he's just cussing into the mics and everything. And Glenn's like, dude, stop cussing. <laughs> it was pretty funny though. Yeah, I was still trying to show <laughs> Yeah. No, but I remember that game because they went. They, I think they went. They went spikes up like in the ninth inning or something like that. And he was, he was looking for anybody in a Missouri State jersey. Did they are they showing the bottom of the seventh again? Am I crazy here? Yeah, I, 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 I just moved it. I just moved it to the uh, top of the eighth. Yeah. Well, don't do that. Yeah. Don't move. Don't move it. Move it back. So now you're ahead of us. I think they're showing it again, though. They are. Okay. I was wondering what was going on. I I thought my computer had paused, so I I moved it back too. What do you what timestamp are you guys at? Two uh, four. Uh, yeah. Ten. 204.10. The only reason we can't move it is because they take this this audio recording and lay it over. So right. we've got to try oh, to stay cool. within the confines of what it is that, that we have. So there's two oh, outs right now. There's two outs right now, and they're about to get you're, you're about to face the third. Perfect. I'm right there. That was weird. I was like, wait a minute. I thought they just didn't I just pitch? <laughs> yeah. I, I thought maybe I had clicked something or something. I know. Me too. I was like, wait a second. What happened here? And th- in this tournament, and, and it happens often in tournaments, uh, but in this tournament specifically, the, the first game went according to book, if you will, because the four beat the five. But from that point forward, we beat Indiana State, Southern Illinois, the six seed upset Wichita, and Bradley upset Missouri State. How common do you feel that happens in – tournaments when you get eight teams involved yeah you know especially this particular year because everybody was in agreement there was a lot of balance yeah uh, in the conference we were no certainly not an eighth seed team from a talent standpoint so were you you, favorites yeah yes yeah so yeah and and, uh i think a lot of it has to do with you know on a given year certain (laughs) conferences have more balance and then you're going to see so-called upsets. I think everybody, all the coaches would agree, there really weren't a lot of upsets. Anything could go. Everybody had one or two really rock-solid starting pitchers. And when that's the case, you're going to see some of these games. So I don't think anybody was overly surprised. Maybe Bradley beating Missouri State, the home team, might have been a surprise. But I don't think anybody was surprised when we beat Indiana State because they knew Ty was capable of beating anybody. Um, and we were we were capable of playing like we did that day on a consistent basis. We just hadn't done it throughout the regular season. So um, most of the time you see some upsets, but I think that year uh, there was a lot of good there was a lot of good teams in that in that league that year. So us doing what we did really did not surprise anybody. Now, similar to our first year in the Big East, this was a winner-takes-all game as you get to the finals. I'm noticing that both Southern Illinois and yourself got there without a loss. Uh, Was there talk back then of having a double elimination, true double elimination? Uh, Was that the year that we went into kind of pods? Yes, you were in pods. So you were playing with Indiana State, yourself, Illinois State, and Evansville. You went 2-0 and went to the finals. The other pod, Southern Illinois, went – 3-0 3-0 and and, or 3-0 and for both of you to get to the finals. So you both were undefeated coming into that championship game. I think we decided that if the if you won your pod or your division, that, you know, you would go to the championship game and the winner takes all. So um, there wasn't really a lot of talk about – and a lot of times it's dictated by TV. 
you know, I think we were on Fox Midwest at that time with the Valley and they wanted one championship game. They didn't want a what if game. So I, I think a lot of times at that time, especially because we were so thirsty to get any kind of television um, that we would uh, do whatever TV dictated. And that's what happened. I think both in the big East, the first year and that, in 2012 with this, uh, with this format that we had. Ty, what do you remember about that championship game when you're coming back on short rest and it's sort of a bullpen day, but you're able to go out there and, and although you gave up some runs, you, you got through three innings and gave your team a chance. Did you get a yeah. game? Did in you? the championship? Yeah, he pitched. He was. I thought you gave up. I thought, I thought you just... <laughs> oh, really? I just remember six Ks and three and two thirds is all I remember. Oh, oh you're thinking of 2011. Oh, and, yeah. And this year, I, I started the championship game um, and against Southern Illinois. I think the first inning went all right. I think I gave up a homer in the second inning, and I think I ended up giving up like four runs, maybe something like that, in the third. And I remember – Three in the third. Four, four total. Four total. I, I remember kind of like walking off the mound like – you know, like, shoot, everything that we worked for, I felt like, man, maybe I, I'd kind of blown that um, to, to win that championship game. And then I'll never forget, um, ball gets hit to center field. We got we got some runners on base, routine fly ball to center field in that championship game, and the center fielder lost it. Um, and we were just screaming from the dugout because we could tell that he couldn't see it. And I, I think – I don't remember if – Gerber was on second base, but I, I think Gerber was on second. We were just screaming at him to, to like, run. Um, and that's when that's when the momentum of that game flipped. I think we ended up scoring four or five runs at half inning. And the next thing we know is uh, we've got the lead back and we just keep tacking on and tacking on. Yeah, it was a hot, hot, hot night, wasn't it? Remember how hot it was that night on the Saturday evening there in Springfield? Yeah. And uh, both of you guys were coming back on short rest. Right. You know, they knew a guy by the name of Cody Forsett, and Cody came back in the same situation. So it was – we are – you know, after we got the starters out, it came down to a bullpen game, and our bullpen clearly outshined their bullpen uh, mm -hmm. that Saturday, that championship game. I'll never forget during this conference tournament, one of the funny things that happened was um, the night before uh, this game here that we're watching, uh, we all went to Chili's and we had uh, – Shocking. Ed took a group to Chili's or Outback. Those are the two things that are on every road trip. I'm sorry, Ty, go ahead. Yeah, so, so we went to Chili's and we uh, – then the next day before this game, we went to Chipotle for lunch. And Chipotle it was just a walk down from the hotel, right down by the ballpark. And then uh, after we won this game, uh, I remember they were like, all right, where do you guys want to go to dinner? And it, they gave us a couple options, but we were like, we want to go back to Chili's. And we all sat at the same tables that we sat at the night before with the same guys that we sat at, <laughs> sat with, and we all had to order the same food. Oh. And so for – for as long as this tournament went on, I think it was like three or four straight nights, we all sat at the same table in the same chilies, and we didn't even need menus. We all just would take turns ordering for the entire table. And uh, we'd go to Chipotle for lunch before the game, and that was that was our routine. And, and we were not going to break from that no matter what. Baseball players, man. Yeah. It works. You know what? You don't mess with the streak. Whatever it is, whether it has anything to do with it, you don't mess with the streak. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've done from a superstition standpoint in your career, Ty? That was probably next. one of them. Was it? <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that, one, that one's one that sticks out for sure. Um, you have a little – I'm surprised yeah, you yeah. have to go to the bathroom in the middle of this game when you're pitching here with Chipotle and chilies in your system. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> uh, that's, that's that old college digestion system for you. Yeah, there you go. Ed, what about you? What's, Ed, what's the weirdest thing you've done from a superstitious standpoint? Your whole baseball life. Uh, yeah, I I tend to wear the same sleeves uh, for the whole season. The whole know, season. Uh, 
I mean, I wash them obviously, but oh. ones, you know, and even if it's, um, uh, cause a lot of times I'll, I'll wear two sets of sleeves cause it's cooler. I'll have that same set underneath the whole year. And I, I wear sleeves a lot, even though, even on days like this, normally I would wear sleeves. Now this game here, it was during the day and there was no chance it was going to get cooler. So, uh, I wore, I didn't have sleeves on, but pretty particular about the sleeves and socks that I wear. Gotcha. Now, Coach, at this point in time, it's, it's a 5-0 game. you got runners at the corners with one out, and you got Judkins up. Was there any thought of laying down a, a safety squeeze or trying to just push across that sixth run, or what's going through your mind at this point in time? Yeah, yeah. I, I You know, um, sometimes I hesitate just a little bit to bunt with a safety squeeze with a left-hand hitter. Okay. Because if the pitcher sniffs it out at all, it's easy for him to throw the ball just on the, you know, away from the hitter. And then it's an easy play for the catcher to throw behind and back pick the runner at third. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we won't bunt with a left hand hitter up there, even though Nick was an outstanding bunter. He was outstanding. But sometimes you just go on a gut too. And, and Nick was swinging the bats pretty well. And I'm thinking not only <clears> – <throat> Do I want to get a run here? But I want to get keep Nick going for the next game. I'm already starting to think about making sure our hitters are <clears throat> in some kind of rhythm for the next game. Because I felt tie. There was they really, they really were showing no indication that they were getting the tie. So I'm thinking about okay, we're going to finish this game, and I want our hitters to gather some momentum for the next game too. And I wanted Nick to get a. I, I really felt Nick was going to get a good swing there, even though he hit it into a double play. Now, Coach, you talked about um, knowing that you wanted Ty to finish. At any point, did you get the bullpen up in this game? You had confidence, but at any point, did you get the bullpen up or get somebody even loosening their arm? I don't believe we did because, like Ty said, I didn't want the guys to throw anything in the pen. I wanted them to have a complete off day. And, uh, and even though, you know, sometimes we look at a, at a, at a pitcher like Ty, and, okay, he threw nine innings. You didn't, it's nice you didn't have to use any bullpen guys. Well, you might have used them in the bullpen. They might have thrown 20 or 25 pitches in the bullpen in anticipation of coming into the game. So it was our goal, once we got to the eighth inning here, was not to use anybody else. They weren't going to throw. They weren't going to play catch. They weren't going to do anything. This was Ty's game. Unless he got above like 120 pitches, then we take him out. But Ty was strong. He's always he, he's in excellent shape. And we knew that <laughs> you stole he, was going there. To, uh, he was going to finish this game. All right, I got one more they're question. Trying, they're, trying, they're, trying to, they're trying to slow Ty down right here. Look at this. He, he, called, he, called, for, he called for time, didn't get it. You got the strike. He pulls out, um, tells him to get back in. Go ahead, Glenn. Uh, one thing I, I got for both of you is is part of our job in the media is always to 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 look back. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Did you think at all about saving a few pitches for Ty and using someone on the back of your bullpen with a five run lead? It turned out obviously you won the tournament, but you knew you were going to have to go back to Ty at some point in this tournament. Did that thought run through your mind? Because I know it always does. Was that there? But we knew if we were going to bring Ty back on Saturday, so this is Wednesday right here, that we were going to limit his pitch count. You know, it would be 45 to 50 pitches. That's exactly what we did the year before. When we had Jonas Dufek and Ty, what we asked Jonas to do, throw 45 pitches, okay? He, I think he threw 44 that night. Okay, Ty, you have 45 pitches. And between those two starters, we got 90 pitches and then we could make it a bullpen game. So if we were going to use Ty on Saturday, and we knew we would, it would be 45 to 50 pitches. Now, how many outs that is, that's up to the offense. But we weren't going to extend Ty because we know he has a future plan at the next level. But he was strong enough to come back and give us 45 or 50 pitches on two days rest. 
what are your either of your guys' philosophies on that? Because you see, you know, and you can call it like arm abuse if you want, but I mean they're trying to win, and then you got a competitive pitcher that will say yes no matter what. But like where you've got guys, you're like, all right, just turn it loose and whatever you got in terms of effectiveness, that's when you're in or out instead of sort of a pitch count. Like, where do you guys stand on letting guys, especially young pitchers like what Ty is in this game right here, of of letting them cut it loose versus making sure that they're doing it in a healthy and safe manner. Well, you know, we know we got to win, right? We know we got to win the tournament. So you're trying to balance all of that. But at, at no time are you ever going to put a player in a position where he potentially could hurt himself. So we know Ty's got a future. Even back in 12, we knew he was going to pitch a long time what professionally. And we didn't want to break him down. So we were going to use him. Ty would have probably pitched five or six innings on Saturday if we wanted him to, but we weren't going to ask him to do that because I knew I'd, the answer I'd get. And that's where your coach has to come into play and be smart about it and not put winning over the safety of the players. And this is why you play a regular season to build up your bullpen too. Mm. And we knew we had a good bullpen. There wasn't any question about that. And those guys want to get in games. They want to pitch. So that's why we extended tying this game. We knew that uh, if we got to Saturday, he was going to be under a strict pitch count and that we were going to trust our bullpen to get us over the top. And that's exactly what happened. Ty, what about you? How do you feel about that when you see that in the game, especially at the, you know, especially at the college level? And, I mean, you look at, you know, just as an example, you look at Oregon State's Kevin Abel and he pitches his bag off to win the championship for him. But, I mean, I think he just started going off the mound – for the first time since his arm broke down, I think, what, a week ago or so, or yesterday, a couple of days ago, like, they won a national championship, but he sacrificed some things to do it. Like, what, where, do, where, do you, where do you draw the line in the balance of, of how much you're willing to cut loose and let your coaches do things like that? Yeah, I think, I think you have to be smart as a player because we, we don't ever want them to take the ball out of our hands. And we think, you know – that no matter what we can handle the the situation and, and we're going to be fine coming through it. But you've just seen it too often with these guys that, that break down uh, because of what they they have done. You see some of these, these closers come in and throw eight or nine or 10 innings in some of these college, you know, tournaments. And it's just like, man, like this guy hasn't thrown more than an inning and all of a sudden he's throwing nine and then they're asking him to go do it again. You know, some of the guys, depending on their arm angles, they may be okay. You know, some of the some of the sidearm guys, it, like it's a little easier on them, but it, it definitely takes a toll on pitchers, and it's hard because there you are trying to find the balance of winning, but you also uh, are trying to make sure that the guys are protected too. So, like that's something that I always respected. You know, the Creighton coaching staff for is um, they prepared me for for this situation. Uh, I started a lot of midweek games this year. Uh, so I would pitch on Friday and then I would start and throw an inning or two in a lot of the midweek games. So, um, and that was kind of like, that would just bullpen. be like your bullpen basically. Right. And so that, that was kind of a, the same kind of the same kind of thing. So if I was starting on Friday, then I'd have Saturday, Sunday, Monday off, and then I'd throw one or two innings on Tuesday. So my, my body was used to bouncing back a little bit quicker. Um, I, w I had pitched in those situations and a lot of the time the midweek games were in Nebraska and they're Kansas and they're Kansas state. So I'm pitching against some high quality teams. So it's not like I'm just out there pitching in a nothing game. Uh, so this was a really important situation for me because when I get into that game on you know, the championship game on Saturday, I feel like I can go more. I can extend because my body is used to it mm -hmm. and I'm not in a position where I'm going to get hurt. Often you see it where the end of the last inning chance makes a great diving play 
you know, and then he, he's right out there leading off the next inning, trying to get things going again. It happens all the time in baseball. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I just always think it's crazy how that happens. You know, a guy, guy has all this defensive momentum, and and a lot of the time you'll see it carry over offensively too, right afterwards. You probably love that as a player when you make a great play like that to get in, and you're first up. Just a lot of momentum. You, you're feeling very confident, um, and baseball is is all about confidence. It's all about, you know, being excited you know having that positive energy that momentum going your way and when you can have that and roll with it it makes it a lot of fun now ty i think i think if uh my memory serves me did you have two other complete games this year so this was going to be your third one is that is that true glenn maybe you can check on that for us but so what are you doing right now in the dugout you know it's the top of the ninth you know you got three outs um, you're trying to save the bullpen, you're having a drink of water, you know, you might be talking to your pitching coach for a, a moment. And then are you just alone then? Do you just sit alone and try to gather your thoughts? Or are you talking to, I know Boomer just came up, so he's the catcher. Um, are you just sitting there thinking, okay, I gotta, I gotta find something here. I gotta get through the ninth inning. I wanna conserve myself. I might be used again in this tournament later on. What, what's going through your mind right now? Yeah, a, a lot of those different things. So, like, for me, I, I remember just sitting here. Um, I think I threw a complete game two weeks before this uh, against Dallas Baptist, uh, and that might have been my first complete game. And then I think I probably would have thrown one a couple of, uh, the next week against Wichita State. Um, but I, we, you guys were kind of limiting my pitch count. I think I threw, like, 70 pitches in seven innings because they – we knew we had a short turnaround coming back for the tournament. So I had been in that rhythm to where I knew what it took to finish a game. Um, and having thrown a complete game earlier on in the year um, and having had a chance at one earlier on in the year against Portland and not completing it, uh, and we ended up losing that game, I knew what it took to finish a game now. And I was just trying to stay focused on executing one pitch at a time because as soon as you start in the ninth inning thinking about uh, trying to get the last out before you have the last out, you're not going to get it. So right here, I'm thinking, all right, just get this first guy out, you know, execute pitches on this first guy, and then it's execute pitches on the next guy. And then from there, you know, we'll see, we'll see where we are. And you can't go get too far ahead of yourself. Um, but yeah, you're just trying to stay quiet, stay collected. And then when that moment comes, you just give it everything you got. Yeah, I, was just looking, I was just looking at it, Ty, like you, you pitched eight innings at Bradley in a loss, and then you didn't allow a run against Nebraska in some midweek work. Then you went a complete game, no one runs Dallas Baptist, seven innings, no one runs Wichita State. And then the one hitter today, you were locked in that whole stretch. Like, was that the best? That the best stretch of your career right there what what attributed to that do you think how did you lock in at that point yeah i basically happened right when school got out so one thing that people never really you know attribute is like the demands that you have as a stu student athlete and this was one of my hardest loads i think as a student and i was also so i was trying to balance like my heaviest class load uh having to talk with a lot of different scouts for teams for the draft that was coming up and try to pitch, you know, and, and compete. And it gets to be a lot uh, as a student athlete to try to balance all of that. And once school got out and all it was was baseball now, I just remember feeling so much relief and, and feeling like, you know, I felt a lot more rested because I wasn't having to stay up till three or four in the morning studying mm. uh, just because that's, that's how hard the classes were at the time. Um, so you just you – know, you get into this time of year where it's baseball only and you're like, okay, like it's, it's go time. And uh, that's the only thing on your mind for, for a month straight, you know, you're with the team every meal of the day. You're, you're going out to eat with them at wheat, wheat fields for breakfast. And then you're meeting at, uh, you know, Chipotle or somewhere for dinner. And then, uh, uh, or for lunch and then at dinner you're all going over to 
um, out back or something like that. And, and it was always a lot of fun because it was baseball 24 seven. And, and that made that time of year so much fun in college because that's all you had to think about. Getting that first out right there in the ninth inning on the first pitch is huge. Yeah. You know, you, you're trying to, trying to come in and attack and, and get into that rhythm in the ninth inning. And that guy swings at the first pitch and grounds out. You're like, okay, this is awesome. And now it just allows you to just go right in and attack this next guy. And, and you can start to smell it. You know, you're like, okay. That shutout's, shutout's big. You want that shutout round. Not only yes. do you want the win, you want the shutout. You Absolutely. Know? So you can but take it deep it. a little bit right now. You're going, going to get some extra. And I know that if – I start to get a guy or two on base. That's when the bullpen, because my pitch count is starting to get a little bit higher, and that's when the bullpen would have a have to maybe get up. And that's what I'm. That's what that's all I'm trying to do right here is avoid that. So just attack as much as I can, and I think I get a little amped up here this at bat. This last one I try to do a little too much. Yeah. Try to end it with an exclamation point, you know, and and. Then I was like, okay, we got to refocus, get back to what we were doing right here for these first couple of guys. I don't remember if I walk him or if I hit him right here, but. Let's try to overthrow a little bit. And ninth innings are interesting because the team that's, you know, kind of been asleep that whole time, basically, or been put to sleep that whole time, they feel like this is this is it. Their backs against the wall. They come out really aggressive. Guy puts a decent swing on the first pitch, thinks he's got a base hit right to somebody, and then all of a sudden he you know, to, juices you, you up. Want, you just wanted to end a game with Lucas, huh? The uh, <laughs> player of the year. Here he <laughs> is. And um, you got him out. You know, so you just wanted to get Lucas out one more time. Yeah. Uh, I remember thinking that. I was like, okay, well, this guy's this guy. I don't know if he had been voted the player of the year yet, but I knew he was yeah. one of the best players in the conference. And it was like, okay, like th this this is what it's all about is in this kind of situation. I you know I got to give everything that I've got um, against best player in the league and. Let the let the best guy come out on top. So major league two style, where you wanted the best hitter, you want to strike out the best hitter at the end of the game. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll walk him. What? <sighs> strike one's been pretty big for you too today. Yeah, that that that's the key, I think, especially in games like this where you're trying to limit your pitch count. If you can get ahead of hitters, strike one, then you're going to shrink the count so much because you're able to dictate things. They're going to have to be a little more aggressive in a, either an 0-1 or a 1-2 count, you know, chase something, maybe a pitch that you want to throw, make them expand a little bit. But you're able to just dictate counts. You're able to expand a little bit there on the 0-1 fastball and, and move it a little bit off the plate. Let's see if he'll, you know, chase and, and you get the call. On a pitch like that, on a, you know, when day day is going well for you, so um, it just makes it a lot easier if you get that first that first strike. Hmm. Boom! That was a tied him up. Great pitch to end the game on, especially the pitch before you threw it away a little bit, and then right underneath his hands. And as good a hitter as he was, he didn't have a chance. That was a maybe your best pitch of the day and your last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's so we'll just one of those situations where it's like, all right, like that you, you do your job and, and you know that, okay, like we're going to go, we're going to go far in this tournament now. Um, and, and everybody's pumped because our offense has come to life. Uh, we, we've just scored five runs off one of the best pitchers in the league, a uh, guy that we hadn't been able to do anything off of in the regular season. And everybody's got all this confidence. We got a fresh bullpen and we're just able to go out there and just put up a ton of big numbers uh, the next few games offensively. Yeah. I think that was the one thing that you look at when you're watching this game, just from an observer and you're like, you know, you know, I guess, you know, going in the season hasn't gone according to plan, but you're looking for, I don't know what the team's going to, 
how the team is going to approach the conference tournament, knowing it's their last chance to get to the NCAA regionals again. Um, but I mean, from all phases of the game, I mean, defensively, you guys are really sharp, made some great plays. I can't even remember a mistake, honestly, like not even just an error, but a, a, a missed, a poorly executed play. Uh, you know, your base running was pretty good, except for a few times where Manaya caught you. Um, and then Ty was really sharp on the mound. And you guys, I mean, from just all three phases looked pretty locked in. Like, even though you're the eighth seed, it looked like you guys, you could see from this performance why the rest of the tournament went the way it did. Now we got some two out base hits, you know, that's a, that's a game changer. You get two out base hits that usually defines who wins the game and who loses. And, you know, Murphy's hit was with two outs. Chase Chance Ross's hit was with two outs. Um, and those were hits we weren't getting in the early part of the year, in the middle part of the year. Mm-hmm. And, um, but again, th- that team knew they were far too talented to be in the position they were. And they were given a second chance, and they took full advantage of it. I mean, we played some excellent baseball in the regional that year, too, Ty. You know, yeah. you remember, we lost to UCLA on a yeah. Friday. You pitched a great game. Um, Low but, scoring. You lost, but you lost to Plutko, you know, 3 nothing. And then we went on to beat San Diego with Chris Bryant, 8-2. to two. Yeah. We went on to beat New Mexico with uh, Graver, the catcher who hit 20-some home runs for the Twins last year, 7-3. Yeah. And then we lost to UCLA in the regional final. Um, but we played some excellent baseball the last three or four weeks of the, reg- uh, the, the season. It was good to see because the guys were really frustrated for the better part of the year. And it was nice to see everything end on a, on a positive note. You know, they got rewarded for their hard work at the end. So it was really, it was fun. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Then uh, I appreciate you guys taking time out. I know two and a half hours to sit and watch a game you have already seen probably several times and played in. Um, isn't the best way to spend your afternoon, but hopefully it was a, it was fun to relive and see some, see some of the moments that led to this run here that you guys put together at the end of the season. And obviously Ty doesn't mind watching a one hitter. I mean, some of his best work in college. So I really appreciate the, you guys being generous with your time um, and taking us, you know, inside this performance here that sparked a late season rally for you guys. Well, Ty, I just want to wish you, wish you the best. I don't get to see you much, obviously. So I hope major league baseball starts as soon as possible. Absolutely. I hope that, you know, when you guys get back to your spring training and preparation for the season, if it does happen, that things go well for you. And uh, congratulations on a great pro career so far. I know you got better days ahead of you yet. So you got a lot of folks pulling for you back here in Omaha. We're watching every step that you take. Keep doing what you're doing. I know you're working your backside off. Say hi to your family when you see them. Your family has always been great to create in athletics. And, uh, we wish you the best. Stay healthy. You and your wife stay healthy. And uh, let's get this pro baseball stuff going again, okay? That sounds great. We miss it a lot. We miss yeah. it a lot. I think everybody's missing baseball right now. So thank you guys for doing this. It's a lot of fun. And uh, just appreciate everything that, that Creighton does has done for us. And uh, go Jays. All right, man.